Dozens of countries, hundreds of cities, millions of people, one man, now in the palm of your hand, on any device. For over 60 years, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has dedicated his life to spreading the message of freedom, justice, and equality to people all over the world. Log in to NFA Studios and get unlimited access to a vast library of his life's work, plus never released lectures, interviews, and exclusive content. With new releases every week, NFA Studios is your one-stop destination for spiritual and mental upliftment. And now, introducing NFA Original Content, featuring shows such as Dinner with the Minister, <laughs> How to Eat to Live Cooking Show, 40 Miles, the series. In this series, we're going to look at the history of the Nation of Islam. Food Nation. And much more. The wait is over. Welcome to the evolution. Welcome to NFA Studio. The messenger of the Lord of the world. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad as I greet you. He departed in 1975. His son assumed power, and within a few years, the nation as we once knew it was completely gone. I watched it step by step, how Allah allowed things to unfold. This episode, we're going to take a look at what it took for the minister to rebuild the nation. When I left Mecca and decided to rebuild the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, then all of the forces that would come against me did. We had great opposition. And the climate was so hateful. Christian and Muslim and Jew, believer and non-believer, stay away from Madison Square Garden. The people literally tore the doors off of Madison Square Gardens. So now the nation is thriving and moving forward. The followers came right up to walk with me. They knew we were ready now, but the minister told us, never be aggressive. They were like angels that our law put around me. I remember it just being a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. It was off the chain. <laughs> and I look back and go, how did we do it? He said, See, Aziz, the only thing that works is the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Welcome to 40 Miles. Welcome to Food Nation. We're going to be traveling cities across the country, tasting the best of foods nationwide. The food is here! She put flowers in the chicken, son. Let's go, let's get out of here, man. Greetings, I'm Sister Hania, and this is How to Eat to Live. I believe it's done. Our whipped, mashed cauliflower. I'm telling you, this eggplant right here, it's a winner. are what helps the breadcrumbs stick to the eggplant. We don't want to use aluminum. We can use cast iron or stainless steel, but never aluminum. Aluminum is a reactive metal. When you scratch the bottom of the pan, then that aluminum comes up and gets in your food. 
and that's poison. An eggplant, like I said, it's very high in fiber. It has magnesium, niacin. It was one of the good vegetables for us to eat. When we think of marriage, everyone has their own idea of what the ideal marriage looks like. A man and a woman and their children. You see the woman and she's so in love and the man can't take his eyes off of her. So we know what it's supposed to look like on the outside, but there's a lot that goes into having the ideal relationship. Are we strong enough to go through the struggles to find love on the other side? Why even go into something knowing that you'll face difficulties? Since the beginning, there's always been a man and a woman. So I guess you can say that since it's always been here, that love is as natural as breathing. So it's a struggle, but it's an uphill struggle. The ability to love through the darkness. Love in black. Well, getting married, according to uh, what we have learned from the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, as well as the scriptures of Bible and Holy Quran, marriage, Prophet Muhammad said, is one half of faith. So if faith is the spiritual journey that one goes from being what is called worthless water or sperm into a process of evolving to becoming a reflection of God, if marriage is half of faith, then marriage is half of that journey to become one with God. Bearing witness to the Bible and that statement of Prophet Muhammad, the male and the female were created two twin halves of a single essence. Well, if man and woman was created in pairs, what would you call a person that only had one eye or one leg? They are called handicapped. So when a man is without a woman, he's handicapped. And when a woman is without a good man, she's handicapped. So getting married makes you a complete you. Okay, so. Where were we? How we met? We met in middle school. First time that I seen Aisha was at Sabres Day. We met at the gym. We first met when I was 15 years old and she was 13 years old. Do you want to tell the how we met story? Because we both tell it differently. <laughs> um, I'll start. Through NFA, our own platform, the people will be able to meet the minister, see the minister, experience the minister. The teaching is there and it will resist now because it's the truth. It can't be bent. This is the platform. So may Allah bless NFA, may Allah bless all those who would work on behalf of the vision and let the vision continue to expand. Never fall again. Never fall again. America, America, America was not built on a firm foundation. The nation called America was doomed from its inception. How do you build a nation? The nation? Killing the native people. How do you build a nation? The nation, the nation. Bringing a whole people out of Africa to America to be made slaves. slaves. This is your foundation. The world.
world is looking at a country going to hell. You are opting to be a part of that that is unraveling right in front of your eyes. You see the country cascading downward. This is America. Why do you want to get into something that is coming to an end? So we are living in the time of the unraveling of this great nation. Welcome to the Foodie Spot. My name is Sister Carmela Muhammad, and we are a proud sponsor of Doing the Math with Dr. Wesley. I come to you in preparation for possible hard times. Um, we've been told to store food in our home by the Alma Missiles Farrakhan, so you can also come to the Foodie Spot and get your navy bean soup, vegetable medley soup, and lentil bean soup, pressure cooked can. Um, in addition to that, I have dried navy beans. We also have frozen dinners prepared that you can actually store in your freezer for those times. Pull them out, warm them up, cook them. We also have our natural antibiotic, which consists of fresh ginger root, turmeric root, garlic, and horse relish. We are also shipping our natural antibiotics in addition to our navy beans red lentil, vegetable medley, and bean pies. For shipping, call 773-420-3948. Again, for shipping, call 773-420-3948. Thank you and enjoy the show. creators and welcome to this week's episode of doing the math with dr wesley muhammad i'm your host janita harris and today we're in for a very important and special conversation we're going to do things a little bit differently and i'm going to actually first introduce our first guest rabbi harry rosenberg is the co-founder of the theological research institute rabbi rosenberg is an international lecturer and a researcher on the israelite diaspora Please welcome with me our esteemed guest, Rabbi Harry. Hey, Sha Hi, how are you? Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited. You know, when I first learned of your research, I reached out just to learn more about your work and you responded. So I was like, oh, he responded. Let me see if maybe he would be willing, him and Dr. Wesley would be willing to come and teach us all because of everything that's been happening in the world. And, you know, you agreed and we're open and I'm very excited for what's going to happen today and to learn. Oh man. Thanks so much. Me too. And with that being said, I'm going to take the time to introduce our next guest. While many people know Dr. Wesley, let me tell you a little bit more about him. Dr. Wesley Muhammad is a student minister in the Nation of Islam who sits on the Executive Council, the governing body of the Nation of Islam, under the direction and guidance of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Dr. Muhammad is also on Minister uh, Farrakhan's personal research team. Dr. Muhammad holds a bachelor's degree in religious studies from Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. He also holds a master's and a doctorate's degree in Islamic studies from the University of Michigan, Art. Ann Arbor. Sorry about that. He is a he has published in several peer-reviewed scholarly journals and has also written for the Final Call newspaper, which is the Nation of Islam's flagship publication. Dr. Muhammad is the author of several books, including Understanding the Assault of the Black Man, Volumes 1 and 2, and The Book of God, an Encyclopedia of Proof that the Black Man is God. 
Welcome with me, our other esteemed guest, Dr. Wesley Muhammad. How are you, Sister Janita? I'm excited. I am pumped. Uh, this and is going Rabbi, to be great. Rabbi Harry as well. How are you, sir? Excellent. Thanks so much for making time for me. Where are you? Did you both know real quick that uh, today, actually, this week is Black Jewish Unity? <laughs> I did not know that. I know that wasn't intentional, but just so you both know, the American Jewish Committee, along with the National Urban League, have now coined today, today from September 6th to 11th, to be Black Jewish Unity Week. So it's quite interesting that this show naturally falls on today of all days to fall. Must be destined. That's beautiful. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I was not until recently aware that we had such a thing as Black Jewish Unity Week. Um, it, it's appropriate that this conversation will be had today. Um, I'm honored that Rabbi Harry would um, join us. I'm thankful to you, Sister Janita, for um, being inspired to reach out to Rabbi Harry. I'm honored that Rabbi Harry would agree to have this conversation and have it today, being that it is. Um, we are in the midst of Black Jewish Unity Week. Um, I, I think we want to explore what that what that means Rabbi Harry, Black Jewish unity, um, and, and what such a week would, what's its worth, what's its value, if there's any value other than window dressing, um, or even camouflaging, um, maybe the true nature of the Black Jewish relationship. So we're honored, I'm honored that um, I can participate in, in such a, a timely conversation as this. Right. And we have a lot to discuss today. We actually have quite a few topics. We will do, be discussing God, the Messiah, anti-Semitism, and uh, anti-Blackness, and much more. What I'm curious, though, and maybe Dr. Wesley, you could um, help start this off, though, is when we are talking about God, are we talking about two separate gods, one of the Islamic faith and one of the Jewish faith, perhaps? First, let me start most appropriately in the name of God, in the name of Allah, who came in a personal master, Fard Muhammad, to whom all holy praises are forever due. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And I bear witness that the God of all of the scriptures um, is the same God. I bear witness that the honorable, most honorable Elijah Muhammad is his living and exalted Christ. Further bear witness that the honorable, the minister Louis Farrakhan is their divine reminder and indeed the Messiah that the world has been awaiting for 2,000 years. Um, in their names I greet um, you, Rabbi Harry, Salam Aleikum. I greet the audience, um, Asalaam Aleikum. Um, the question of your question, I would answer in the affirmative or negative if the question was are they separate gods um the god of the bible and the god of the quran would be the same but i do offer if i may this caveat i heard you in one setting rabbi harry I forget which one. You mentioned defending your intentions to defend the God of Israel. And that's a very noble and indeed appropriate endeavor. I do admit that when I heard you say that, when I heard the God of Israel, 
my mind went to Psalm 62, where it said, one thing did God say, two things did I hear. And my mind went to the rabbinic discourse on that passage in which the rabbis elaborated that that suggested in scripture, everything that's written is multivalent, has various meanings, even conflicting meanings in the same passage. But and I heard one thing that God say, two things that I hear, when I heard you speak of the God of Israel in the singular, my mind went to two gods. My mind, as a God of Israel. My mind went to, obviously, Yah, Yahoo or Jehovah or Yahweh, the God who led Israel or the children of Israel out from Egypt and liberated them from their 400 year oppression. But that we understand is, was prophecy at the time the Bible was written that had not happened yet. So in as much as the enslavement was prophetic, the God of Israel that led the children of Israel out of Egypt was prophetic. My mind also went to an historic God found in the Bible as the God of Israel, the God of the ancient Jewish people, not Yahoo or Yahweh, but he's found in the Bible as Yaku. And so one thing that God saying two things that I hear when you mention the God of Israel and your defense of the God of Israel, I thought of those two gods and I was wondering which God were, which God of Israel were you interested in defending? <clears throat> I would be happy to hear your thoughts on the question. Okay, sure. Thanks so much. Um, firstly, it seems like you're telling me that you're like redefining kind of what I'm saying to say that really there are two gods. So I must be talking about one of the two ones. So let me just try to get very clear. What is this other God you're talking about? You were mentioning Yaqub as another God that I may potentially be talking about. I'm trying to understand about yeah. the second God you're suggesting is in the text right now. That's where I'm at. Oh, I, I absolutely am stating because it's a matter of record that the God of ancient Jews, as well as I'm sure you are no doubt aware as a rabbi, God of certain rabbinic traditions acknowledges the God of ancient Jews as Yaku. Now, of course, we know that the early proto-Jews, if you will, you and I both know Israel and Jews are ethnically different. They're different groups. We know that the proto-Judeans, the people who would go on to establish Judea and go on to establish Jew, that when they emerged, probably from the north of the Levant, when they are, uh, when we first encountered them, and when they first encountered the people of Canaan or Israel, they came in worshiping a God, and that God wasn't Yahoo, Yahweh, that God was not even Elohim, that God was Yaku El, as well as Abir Yaku. 
And we know that some of those proto-Judeans would spread into Egypt and spread into Mesopotamia. And they left not only place names in honor of Yaqub, El God, Yaqub, but also left scarabs in honor of Yaqub, El God, Yaqub. We also know that in rabbinic tradition, um, both Midrashic tradition, as well as Hechelot tradition, Merkava tradition in these various rabbinic literatures and intellectual projects. There was absolutely the acknowledgement of, of Yakub. Now, of course, it's written in English as Jacob, but none of them spoke English. In modern Hebrew, it is Yaakov, but they didn't speak modern Israeli Hebrew as well. The biblical name, the Semitic name, the proper pronunciation is Yaakov. And so it is a fact that Yaakov was not just a patriarch in terms of rabbinic tradition, but literally identified as the God of Israel. And so from the first appearance of proto-Judeans in the 18th century um, BCE to the late antique rabbinic period, there is the acknowledgement of Yaqub, God Yaqub. And that's important. I, I wanted to Okay, I mean, listen, there's a lot to unfold with what you just said, but I think we have two totally different viewpoints of what the Jewish people or the Torah is actually about. It seems to me you're talking about a third religion that I'm not familiar with. Um, I've read, you know, the Torah from start to end multiple times, and we don't, you know, obviously we translate it not even into English, we translate it into Aramaic, just to really get an understanding of the text. Um, I've read very thoroughly the, the, the text that you referenced but I, I don't think there's one place that would hint or or even suggest that uh, Yaakov, which is the, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, has anything to do with being a god. All throughout the Bible is just filled with saying there's one god, only one god. You know, it's all over the thing. Um, so I'm, I'm just like, I've never heard this in my life that there is Jewish text of my own religion that would suggest that Yaakov is a god. Maybe you're you're speaking about outside of the, the text of the Bible, but uh, that would be something I'm not familiar with. I never heard before. Okay. I, I would like to um, go. Like I would want to know where your source for that information is. Like even one example from right. a Jewish perspective. Right. That That's great. We have that. If um, I would like to bring bring those up. If you don't mind, I would like to, before I get into that, I wanted to pick your brain, Rabbi okay. Henry, and, and talking about God and, and talking about the God of Israel. Um, I would like to engage you on a subject I, I'm calling theological racial justice given that this is the this is black jewish unity week and there's a lot of discussion of the black jewish relationship the alliance the holy alliance between blacks and jews that's a popular trope more jews speak of that than black people the holy alliance um i wanted to get your thoughts on this this concept that I'm calling theological racial justice. What's theological racial justice? If, if you would indulge me for just a few minutes, I, I want to, and then Rob, to answer your question about what, uh, what sources am I getting this information of the God of Israel from? The God of rabbinic tradition you said you are familiar with the literatures i cited i would like to 
cite some sources en route to engage in you in this question of theological racial justice. Okay. And in doing so, I, I, I want to pull up. I, I want to do so in two ways. Two ways. I, I would like to engage you, Rabbi, with a particular or particular streams of Jewish wisdom, which I happen to be a student of and a a great fan of. All right, let, let me see. I'm trying to share. Trying to share my screen. We'll start there. So, Rabbi Harry, I, I was, um, I, I, I'll start like this if I may. Um, can you guys, is my screen, oh, all right, I want to start. I don't want to do that. So, as, a, as I was matriculating, that there's two points, Rabbi Harry. When I was matriculating at the University of Michigan, uh, pursuing my doctorate, I had two great Jewish instructors. Um, Rabbi Professor Yaron Eliyah, um, a great um, professor there at the University of Michigan. I studied rabbinic texts with Professor Eliyah. Um, also, Professor Elliot Ginsburg, you may be familiar with one or both of them. I, I studied with Professor Ginsburg, Jewish mysticism. Um, I'm a student and an admirer of Jewish mysticism. Um, and while I was studying in, in their classes in 2003, I wrote a paper. Um, it was subsequently uh, accepted for publication in a Harvard Theological Review. But before I submitted it to Harvard Theological Review, the paper is entitled Sapphiric God, Esoteric Speculation on the Divine Body and Post-Biblical Jewish Tradition. Uh, I, before I submitted it to the Harvard Theological Review, I submitted it to Professor Ginsburg and Professor Eliyah for their expert um, take on it. Very interesting. Um, with Professor Eliyav, who I was studying rabbinic tradition with, he said that he gave me the thumbs up for my conclusions. With Professor Ginsburg, whose specialty is Jewish mysticism, that altered the whole nature of our relationship for some reason. Now, the paper, in the paper, uh, I demonstrate, Rabbi Harry, that in agreement with the ancient Near East and Far Eastern tradition of the blue God, um, the ancient Near East and Far East had this motif, this theology, in which God was a God of light, right? but he wrapped his divine light in black material and the light shined through the pores of his black body producing a blue iridescence and this is the the context of the blue gods of antiquity the blueness was a symbol of the light passing through the black body and and i traced the same motif in Jewish tradition. The, for example, the blue 
male or the blue robe of the Jewish high priest. Think, it's like a purple. Right, take a let. Um, so there's there's great discussion on the hue of the blue or purple of the tech. Right. Okay. The male. okay. So while I get into that, we in, in great detail the, the discussion of what the actual shade of blue is and what it signifies. And so we were able to show Rabbi Harry that this tradition, this blue God tradition that presupposes the black God, the blue God presupposes the black God, all right, that this tradition is very Jewish. Not only is it ancient Near Eastern, but it's very Jewish. You find it in, in Kabbalah, right? The, the whole Moshe, Professor Moshe Edel and Professor Elliot Wolfson, for example, talks about the motif of the Torah as black fire on white fire, right? And the anthropomorphizing of the Torah as representing God's anthropomorphic body or Adam Cadman. Adam Cadman is white fire that shines through black fire. And you have the motif, the rabbinic motif and other um, Jewish motifs of the the sacred architecture of Israel is reflective and symbolic of the human body. So the tabernacle and the temple of Jerusalem symbolically represented the human body, but in rabbinic tradition in particular, the black goat skins of the tabernacle rabbinic tradition identified as the black skin of Adam. And so this 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 whole uh, motif- Wait, can you, of, will you just say that the rabbinic tradition said that? Oh, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Because I, I, I haven't seen a rabbinic tradition say that the black skin of the goat represents the black skin of Adam. I'd be interested to oh, see we can that quote, rabbinic we, source. We can quote the Midrash. It's in, I think it's, for example, Genesis Rabbah, and others where the analogy, and we can read it, where... Yeah, if you got the chapter and the verse, we could definitely pull yeah, it up. Where, where the um, analogy, step-by-step step analogy between the body of Adam and each... Okay, I think there's definitely a co comparison figure, between the temple and the each, body, but I wasn't... figure of the tabernacle, yeah. yes, and the skin was specifically, so we're on the same page. In those traditions, the skin of Adam was identified with the goat skin of the tabernacle. The reason I'm, uh, I'm saying this, right? So you have, I, I, I'm sure you're familiar with Professor Moshe Edel, and the, his discussion of black fire and the, the Kabbalistic tradition of black fire and how it becomes blue fire and how it becomes red fire. And all of this anchored in a key aspect of Jewish esoterica, which as Rabbi, when I wrote that article in 2003, that was, I was happy to see in 2010 it inspired Rabbi Hahira to examine the exact same sources that I examined, documenting, in his words, the blue god of Judaism. I described it as the sapphiric god of Judaism. My point is this to you in terms of theological racial justice. Being that the black God and the honorable Elijah Muhammad, the God that is so important to these various strands of Jewish esoterica, heck hello, Merkava, Kabbalah, even allusions in classical rabbinic texts, the black God with this blue iridescence is aligns perfectly with what the most honorable Elijah Muhammad taught. And so my question in terms of this discussion, which I would like to engage you in and on, in terms of theological racial justice, 
when you have Scientific American acknowledging that this representation of a white God, the impact that it has on keeping black people in a subordinate position in society, just a very imagery of a white God. And you have Bernard Lane's book, The Hebrew God with this white man represented as the Hebrew God. Do you think, do you believe that wise Jews have any obligation in terms of theological racial justice correcting this era right do you and if so what would theological racial justice look like when you have and i close on this and, and I, I would invite you to comment being that on the one hand so important to so many strands of Jewish esoterica is this concept of God with a black body. And then on the other hand, you have the Talmudic origin of the malicious and fraudulent curse of Ham narrative, right? The black people are black because God put a curse on them. But well, the Babylonian Talmud originated that, and from that malicious fabrication, slavery and so many abuses of black people from Jews, Christians, and Muslims on the basis of that fraudulent curse of Ham story, black people are black because they're cursed. While at the same time, there's this Jewish esoteric tradition of divine black skin. Do you? believe Jews have any duty in terms of theological racial justice to correct one the um, the curse of ham fabrication and its consequences and by for example supporting the honorable Elijah Muhammad when he articulated explicitly with so many Joe so many wise Jew, wise Jews know um, quietly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, there's a lot of questions in one, but I'd like to try to address as much as I can. Um, yeah, I mean, you did say a lot of things before on behalf of like what the Jews believe in, which is not what any Jew I I know, and I know a lot of Jews where they ever would have heard of anything you're saying. So we'll circle back to some of those the points, but just to say. If you're trying to spend a lot of effort to prove that the original man or the original Israelite, so to say, wasn't a white man, you wouldn't have to try hard at all. You just look in the rabbinic texts. It says in, in the Mishnah, which was written by Rabbi Judah the Prince about 2,000 years ago, he was an exilarch, one of the representatives from the house of David in the exile. In Mishnah Hagiga, second chapter, first, first teaching, he writes that the children of Israel were not white. And it says, and they were not black. It says they were boxwood. That's what the Mishnah says. That's what the teaching says. So when someone tries to bring out all these points in the world to prove to me that the original Israelites weren't white, I say, you're wasting your time. This is something we, we already believe. Um, so there's nothing, nothing to that. But secondly, like now that you're talking about this white God, black God thing, I, I totally think, first of all, it makes no sense in the first place to portray God as a color let alone going into an African-American church and seeing a white man on the wall. Also, that that's just like seems like a strange thing to me to experience in life. Um, but if the Jews had anything to say in this, we're absolutely not even allowed to portray the image of God. So whoever's putting images of God up there, it, first and foremost, is violating uh, basic tenets of the Bible and the Torah. So the issue is not that is there a white God on the wall or a black God on the wall. The issue is that we're putting gods on walls right now, images of gods on walls. And that's just that's just not allowed uh, from from our perspective. Um, so that's just that's just I think an easy answer to what you're saying is if the Jewish people had like a petition or we wanted to march in the streets for choosing a white God or a black God. You know, we would say, guys, there's no gods on pictures on walls. I'm sorry. We just we haven't been doing that for thousands of years. And anyone who does do that is basically straying from the from the path. Mm -hmm. 
if someone was just to join this conversation, I want to acknowledge that this would not necessarily be an introduction college level course. It would probably be an upper level college uh, level course. And because of that, I want to make sure that we make it accessible for individuals that might not know what exactly y'all are talking about. So from my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, we are discussing the image of God being um, transitioned from that of original black God, which Rabbi Harry has said that there, the text does not suggest that he is black or white, but would be, what, what was the word you said, Mudox, Moxwood? Oh, well, you, you, so let me say it again, because I wasn't even talking about the color of God, because we mm -hmm. don't put, we don't talk about what God is. The only things we could say about God really is what he isn't. God is not something finite that we could start defining with colors and attributes. Yeah, there are Kabbalistic texts that refer to us as like, you know, we're, we're created in the image of God. So if we're created in the image of God and we have a hand, so it must be God has a hand. No, it's the opposite. God has something we call a hand. Well, our hands is just an allegory of the functionality of, of God's esoteric being. So we don't put any physical attributes onto God. But I was saying was that there's we teach about the color of the children of Israel, not about the color of God. We don't draw that parallel. Yeah, we're created in the image of God, but we don't say like God's a human who's like, okay, let's say I have long fingernails. Oh, so God has long fingernails? No, it doesn't work that way. But we did teach that the children of Israel were not white originally. That was a teaching by Rabbi Judah the Prince in the Mishnah 2,000 years ago. And he uses the word boxwood, which I would say, you know, I'm not a pro on colors, but some in-between color, um, you know, the color of a tree, a darker color, maybe a Yemenite color, if I'd speculate. But at the end of the day, if you also read the Torah, the Torah is an open source book and not a racially closed off book. So very quickly, people from different nations were allowed to graft themselves in, including the, the great grandmother of King David, uh, Ruth, who was a Moabite, who had sodomite blood in her and grafted herself in. So if you, you know, you got to give me a whole discourse on the color of the, of the people, the sodomites, and how do you know there wasn't one white guy in the genetics? So the genetics really does nothing to do with the makeup of the people of Israel, although we will be very clear to say the original ones weren't white. But it could have taken, I don't know, maybe 100 to 500, maybe 700 years for white guys to start showing up within the nation through marriage and, and conversion or whatnot. Dr. Wesley? Yes, I, I appreciate that, Rabbi Harry. Um, I, I want to be real clear. I, I was not seeking yet so that will come later to I engage you on the Israelites. Right now, the specific conversation is on God. Okay. So the, the Midrashic description of the ancient Israelites, I would like to um, engage you on that later, but I don't want the question to be avoided. What I'm asking, and you're saying something quite astounding to me, if you are saying that what I presented, that you as a rabbi and you learned it in Kabbalah, that you're unfamiliar with the black God of esotericism, but let me say this about God. Mm -hmm. All right. So Rabbi Harry, um, Professor Benjamin Soma, in his most important book, The Bodies of God in the World of Ancient Israel. Uh, Professor Soma um, opens with these words, quote, the God of the Hebrew Bible has a body. This must be stated at the outset because so many people including many scholars assume otherwise. The evidence for this simple thesis is overwhelming. So much so that asserting the carnal nature of the biblical God should occasion no surprise that God has a body that is the standard notion of ancient Israelite theology. God has a body. However, Sunday school teachers and religious sages have long taught Jews and Christians that the Hebrew Bible is distinctive among the religious documents of antiquity, precisely because it rejects the notion of a physical deity. 
the formidable authority of childhood teachers and the less robust influence of theologians have embedded the notion of the non-corporeal Hebrew deity, the bodyless, the immaterial Hebrew deity, so deeply in Western thought that some readers may be skeptical of this point, he says, but biblical authors regarded the substance of the divine body as one of its distinctive features. The body was stunningly bright, but the fundamental to Israelite theology is God has a body. And because God has a body, this is why Shior Koma, I'm sure you're familiar with the mystical tradition of Shior Koma, is very graphic in this description of God's human body, but also the color of the body. So I'm at a loss, Rabbi Harry. When you talk about Moshe Adel, I'm sure you're familiar. When you talk about through a speculum that shines by Professor Elliot Wolfson, the motif of God, not just with a body, but with a body of light is cloaked in a black material veil, a black body, that thread runs through most of Jewish literature, certainly esoterica. So I'm at a loss to understand your reluctance to engage the notion that God has a body and a body of a particular color given that so much Jewish literature. Okay, so with the body of God. I would love to fill you in. So I guess you said you're missing some things. I'd love to help fill in. Um, yeah. Because what you, the person you're quoting, he's not considered Jewish literature, even though he's a Jew. I'll explain what Jewish literature means. And the first thing he said was, there's an overwhelming amount of evidence. And my ears were just like, okay, where's the evidence? Show me a source from Jewish literature. So, so still till today, there hasn't been like quoted a real source in Jewish literature. You can quote a Jew, but that I don't know who this Jew was. So let me explain how, how, how this Jewish literature thing works. I'm going to go, I'm going to maybe try to take a minute to do it. And I'm going to reference, let's say, um, the, the Bitcoin or the blockchain. I don't know how many of your listeners are familiar with it, but I'll explain why the Bitcoin or the blockchain is such a, a trusted currency. Uh, the blockchain is an international verification system that a transaction has happened. So if someone, let's say I give you $10, usually the bank is storing that and that's a private company and that's their records. But now yeah. when I give you $10, the blockchain, everyone around the world says, oh, that transaction happened. They put it on the blockchain. And once it's on this chain, you can never take it out. It's there forever. That transaction is transparent. So what the blockchain did, which made the Bitcoin such a trustworthy currency, was that it solidified the information for the people going forward to use looking backwards. So now let me explain what Jewish literature means. And, 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 I, and I think when we talk about Judaism or the Jewish people, we exclusively have to pull sources from Jewish, Jewish literature. So there is a sort of blockchain system within Jewish information. What does that mean? That means uh, there's a, we, we basically believe there's the written Torah, but then there's an oral understanding to that Torah, right? So the Torah will say to me, and make a, is a commandment. It says, put a mezuzah on your doorpost. That's what the Torah says. It doesn't elaborate what a mezuzah is at all. It just says to do it. So how do we know what a mezuzah is? So we could either rely on certain people, which we'll speak about, I, that, I'm, that I think maybe in your camp um, are creating, uh, you know, uh, exegesis or explanations of verses on their own intellectual understanding. But then we have what's called the, tra the tradition, the transmission from Moses from Sinai down to the people of Israel of what a mezuzah was. So he went, Moses goes into detail explaining to the people how to do it. So that information we believe was passed down orally all throughout the time of the first temple and the, into the exile in Babylon to the return to the second commonwealth with Ezra and Nehemiah. And then all of a sudden we have the redaction of, of the Jewish law, which is from Rabbi Judah the Prince. And if someone wrote a book or someone wrote something down for the next generation to try to make a code of law or something from the text to understand the Torah, and it wasn't peer reviewed or verified by the international Jewish community, it didn't get passed down. So there are more books that have been written to try to explain or understand the Torah than that, than that ever have that had never made it. So, 
So what I'm saying is the system of information we have is if you want to say you're speaking on behalf of Jewish literature, it has to exclusively come from that blockchain network of, of a rabbinical source of my rabbi to my rabbi to my rabbi who could trace back to Moses without missing a generation. If you quote outside of that source, then that could be for all, I, for all I'm concerned or for all the Jewish people are concerned, a new religion, something that is, is, has nothing to do with what really the Jewish people are about. So when you're speaking to me, you're speaking to someone who's attached to the most authentic, centralized source of what Jewish information really is without the fluff or someone, you know, on the periphery who's speculating. And so when, when I say I need a source for what you're saying, I'm going to need a source. And it could be from a 2000 year pool of sources, but it's got to come from that source. And, and just to be very clear, yes, in Kabbalistic texts, there is such a concept of the God body or the body of God. It describes the locks, the hair, all these different parts, but it also stresses beyond a doubt that this is a metaphysical, it's not a physical thing. We, even though we are created in the image of God, God himself is corporeal. And so if you want to prove to me otherwise, I'm going to need a source. If you're going to say, especially if you're going to say, that's what I should be believing based on my own religion, I'm going to need a source from that blockchain of 2000 year old information. Right. So certainly my comment or sentiment is not what you should be, be believing as a Jew. That's not my conversation. You believe what you believe. But let's be real clear, Rabbi Harry. I'm sure you're familiar with Professor Jacob Neusner, who teaches us about the appropriateness of using the language not Judaism, but Judaism's plural. With due respect, what I believe I heard from you is an example of the tyranny of the rabbis. The rabbinic strand of Judaism that concretized in the oral law the Talmud in particular. I understand that's the, the Judaism that you represent, but both of us familiar with the history know that rabbinic Judaism is not the authoritative Judaism, if authoritative means it has, it's aligned with God's judgment. Rabbinic Judaism, the oral Torah, is authoritative only in the sense that it won with the establishment of Israel in particular. It won, and the other Judaisms lost. So that doesn't make your pronouncements more or less necessarily authoritative than other Judaisms, but it is, it is very misleading to posture that the oral law is the only articulation of Judaism. And in fact, the Torah Jews who are non-Talmudic, their commitment is to Torah, and there's a rejection of Talmud, that's one example of the many Judaisms. But I want to get back to the God thing. If well, I just would love to comment on that also, if you may. Um, because you're yeah, obviously right, there's been tons of sects and breakaway groups of Jews trying to create the future of what the Jewish people are and what they believe in. Um, and let me, I'm just going to quote a verse now from Genesis 49.10. It says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, as long as men come to Shiloh, and unto him shall be obedience the peoples be. But basically, when you read the Hebrew words of it, it basically is saying, from Judah until this period called Shiloh, which we'll, we'll see what it means, there's going to be a, a lawgiver amongst the people of Judah. And so if you look at Shiloh, 
the gematria, the numerical value of the word, embedded in it is the word Mashiach, Messiah. So basically the verse is teaching you when Jacob is blessing Judah, he's saying from you will come a line of lawgivers that will be a constant line until the Messianic era, until the Mashiach, until the Messiah comes. And that was his blessing. So when I'm speaking about the, you know, the redaction of the Mishnah 2,000 years ago, I'm speaking about Rabbi Judah the Prince from the line of Judah, which is still until today traced, a very clear line from the house of Judah still traced until today. So when when I say like, you know, if there's a, a group of Karaites or whatever or whatever it is, a different sect of Jew trying to reestablish the Torah, there's two things I want to say. One is, yeah, like I said before, I'll say again, they're creating their own religion. That's another religion. They're still Jewish. They're still my brothers and I have an obligation to love them. But they are absolutely creating something that is nothing to do with what the Jewish people represent from our perspective. And every single one of these groups basically since the you know the 2000 year history has fizzled out or faded away there's no competing law today of like a real of a real established tradition that's saying like oh we're competing against rabbinic jews because usually what ends up happening to a fringe group is their children end up marrying non-jewish people and they become coming assimilated um, so I grew up in a, as a conservative Jew and, and a reformed Jew, which means my family wasn't observant. It was only till later in life that we started keeping commandments and learning Torah. But the area that I came from and the, and the public school that I went to, my Jewish friends, one or two generations later, they're not Jewish anymore. They're, they're, they don't have a memory of it. So there is no line, a 2,000-year-old line, really, of a committed tradition of Jewish information of a group that's outside of this Talmudic Jews that you represent. Yeah, maybe you'll have an author, you know, 100 or 200 years ago, come up with a new theory, maybe had ten to 50,000 people, maybe even 100,000 people, but not even follow that theory but guess what? Their their children have nothing to do with that. That's not a continuous theory, so uh, or a continuous belief. So what we see is there's only one line of information from Moses till today. No one else is claiming to have that line of information from the Jewish people that is in existence. And we believe that that's the fulfillment of that verse that there will be a a, a line of lawgivers. So if someone's a, a Jew but doesn't believe in the Talmud, there's no there's no room for hate in my heart for that person. I'm going to love him as a brother. But I will acknowledge you have created your own religion and you can call it, you want to call it Jew also Jew, you know, like when you save a word doc, there's like number one and number two of it. You can call it Jew too. But that, you know, you know you've just distanced yourself from what is the Jewish people and the survival of the Jewish people through the, through the, the upkeeping of the law and the tradition. As I'm listening to you, um, Rabbi Harry, just now. Yes. I'm thinking of the Talmudic paracote or discussion in which two rabbis are debating a, a verse in the Torah and the Holy One, God himself, weighs in. I'm sure you're familiar with this one. God himself weighs in and the rabbis reject God's interpretation of his own word. And the Talmud has God himself defeated, laughing, saying, ha, 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 my sons have defeated me. So it's not just sex, what you call sex, that are delegitimized by Talmudic Jews, but God himself is delegitimized by Talmudic Jews. Now, I, I want to... Are I'd you love to not, comment on that also. Would mm -hmm. you say? I'd love to comment on that specific uh, teaching. Okay, and, and I would love you to, but I would also, as you do so, also comment on this, because um, Ethiopian Judaism, nearly identical to Second Temple period, Judaism. So it's not, so what we now know is that the Judaism represented by the Ethiopian, maybe what you will call sect of Judaism, that is in no ways Talmudic. Ethiopian Judaism doesn't show any influence of, at least not indigenously, not originally, no influence from Talmudic rabbinic tradition, yet it's been demonstrated that their Ethiopian Judaism is nearly identical to Second Temple Judaism, ancient Judaism. Well, so, let me, 
because mm-hmm. we're grouping lots of different questions together because I'm already forgetting what I wanted to say the, the previous thing. Um, but uh, with the Ethiopians, I mean, Second Temple Judaism was about taking animals and sacrificing them to the Most High to atone for people's sins. So when so- if someone's still practicing Second Temple Judaism, you know, and, and sacrificing animals and whatnot, that's okay. But we do have a, a verse from the Tanakh, from the Torah that says, you know, now instead of the bull offerings, you're going to give me lip service, which we learned the power of prayer. And, you know, for example, as a Jew, I'm praying three times a day, which is rabbinic, so to say. Um, and so you don't maybe have you didn't see Ethiopians praying three times a day. But you look in the in the prophecies, you look at the book of Daniel and you see Daniel going to pray towards Jerusalem three times a day. And he was a prophet, uh, someone who was communicating with the Most High. So you don't see Ethiopians praying three times a day. Is that going to be evidence to say what Daniel was doing with some man-made cult religion stuff? No. What ended up happening is the destruction of the Second Temple. What what what? The, what there had to been a, a survival mechanism to upkeep the Torah. So the Torah still says you have to make a mezuzah. So you'd have to ask the Ethiopian, how do you understand this verse? What is a mezuzah to you? And they will either tell you this is our tradition of what a mezuzah is, or they'll say we lost that tradition because we went into exile at a time where Israel was already potentially worshiping idols, you know, sinning. You know, when the tribes of the north went into exile, they were worshiping golden calves. During the time of the first temple of King Solomon, you had Israelites worshiping golden calves. So now if you show me an exile nation and you're showing me that these people aren't doing what you're doing, I'd be like, okay, they went into exile. Why did tribes go into exile? They were sinning and they were worshiping other gods and God sent them into exile. But that shouldn't be a contradiction to what I'm saying is there was a preserved line of the understanding of the law of Moses. So that's just what I'm saying. The development of, well, you didn't answer. You said you wanted to comment on the rabbinic tradition that delegitimizes God's okay. own. Okay, so I'd love to explain that also. So the way rabbinic Judaism works, because there's many verses like that, that, that God says, you know, the heavens are for me and the land I gave to you. Or there's another verse in this week's Torah portion, or that's upcoming. It says that the, the the Torah is not in heaven for you to go grab. It's down there on earth for you. And so the way the Torah is, is a, is a very practical, fluid document and system where there's lawgivers and there's appointed people to run the nation. And like quantum physics, the eye of the beholder, the spectators, are able to manifest the decision. So when two people are arguing, the rabbis are arguing, you have to say, like, what are they even arguing about? These rabbis may be arguing, how many inches is your sukkah allowed to be? Is your booth that you go in the holiday, is it 10 inches or is it 12 inches? So one rabbi is going to say, hey, this is 10 inches. The other rabbi is going to say, hey, no, it's 12 inches. So maybe God's, I'm just giving an example. So maybe God's going to come in and say, no, no, it's 13 inches. But let's say the guy with 12 inches won the argument. Like, think what you're discussing. They're not battling God on fundamental principles of theology. They're battling God on how the Jewish people live a practical day-to-day life. The Talmud is filled with, uh, you know, monetary laws, business laws, women's rights, how to function, how to, how to perform the, the commandments. But in every generation, there's going to be a, a, something new, an obstacle that's going to come up. And what, what was once relevant, or, you know, for example, I'll give you a great example. Uh, there was a law in the Talmud that says you're not allowed to drink from a bottle from water that was left out open overnight. That's the law. No matter what, that's the law. If it was open overnight, you can't drink it in the morning. So then the commentators have to come the next generation and say, wait a minute, why was this the law? Oh, we have a story from X and Y Z rabbi because that there used to be snakes and they would drink from the water and their venom may get in the water. So you don't, we don't drink from the from the barrels because there's snake venom in it. That's the law. So then they ask the question 1,000 years later and says, wait a minute, we got we're in a, we don't have snakes by us or, we're, or there's no snakes here. So the reason for that law may, may not even apply anymore. So then, so then you have sages and not one sage, you have sages who unanimously will see how to answer questions of how the law is applied. And this is all about what a lawyer is in America, constitutional laws. How is the law applied? So God gave the laws, but he gave it on to man to be to how to apply them. And that's why when you see with Moses and Jethro comes to visit him, and Jethro is like, Moses, you're overburdened with the people. Let's make a system of the thousands, the hundreds, and the tens to, to, to help decide what, what to do with the people. Now, these weren't people communicating with God. These were people who are lawgivers telling the people of Israel how to function. So God, we believe, gave that power to man. And he doesn't sit there and dictate how... You know how many inches uh, 
my 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 mezuzah have to be if at a time where if it's too big it may be dangerous or whatever it is the reason he gave the the, the the power of logic and man to decide for themselves. And again, this is blockchain system. So the rabbis work I I as an international team for 2,000 years. If one rabbi said something and the whole team was like, whoa, whoa, rabbi, we don't vibe, that rabbi's information didn't survive to the next generation. We wouldn't even know his name. He became an irrelevant person in human history. But we, we you know, not to take credit away, he may have been a great guy, not to take credit. I'm saying, I'm saying as far as contribution to Jewish law. But uh, so the way Jewish law works is that, I'm going to refer to again that blockchain system. Mm -hmm. So as, as we close this part out, I want to say this, quote, quote, the sages can overrule not only Rabbi Elazir, but even God himself, end quote. That is from uh, Shmolo Reskin in his article, Halakha is not decided in heaven. In the New oh, York, beautiful! New York. You just Please. you just gave the answer so great. So what is halacha? Halacha right. has nothing to do with dictating the theology of God. That doesn't mean man could overrule God in in you know what God looks like or this or anything have to do with God. Halacha is how we live our day to day life as Jews and how we upkeep the the nuances of the ever changing application of law. And yes, that was put in the hands of man to be to to be in charge of upkeeping that law. And as I said, again, it's not a system where one man can overrule God. The Jewish, there was a Sanhedrin, there was a court. The Jewish people as a whole have to decide that this is the halakha. And when I say halakha, it really means hole, like go. So this is how we roll. This is how we go. And this, that, that has to be decided by so the people. God and that power himself, was given to us. So if God, God gave us that. can't tell you how to live life, no, Ooh, it's, it, 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 you, you have to understand the parameters of this because you're, you're, everything in the Talmud is such deep wisdom that so when it says something, you have to ask the question, in what cases or what scenarios does this information apply? Where does the rabbis have jurisdiction and where don't they have jurisdiction? So it's not, like I said, we can't change fundamental, we can't uproot commandments, we can't uproot principles. We can discuss on the room, the, the, the application of these things. So there's no, the, the 613 commandments were set in stone, basically. No rabbi could uproot them. But So when you say that permission, that we have the rulership over God, that doesn't include certain areas that you may be implying that includes. That's what I'm trying to say. So we want to talk about Messiah. And, let's do it. But you wanted a text because I, I I want to get from you your ideas of theological racial justice. Now, okay. Shia Komar, I did not author Shia Komar. Shia Komar, which is transmitted in the whisper, is fundamental Jewish esotericism which I would be very surprised, Rabbi Harry, if you are unfamiliar with Shior Koma tradition. It's the tradition, the secret tradition transmitted from rabbi to rabbi, from student to student, in the whisper. And the focus is the not just the physical anthropomorphic body of God, but it says specifically his body is like Tarshish. It's a blue body and so the this is allegory well according to you but the scholars that we have cited do not in any way now that's the apart later apology so you're saying that god is some rock like or god's skin is rock like if if no if, no, if that's no. so so how do you so how do we apply it that's what i'm trying to oh. get to and very easily his body is like tarshish tarshish is a blue stone, a sea blue stone. Well, there's a lot of other properties about Tarshish. How do we know that it's referring to, you know? Right. Because the Hekalo, the Merkava, the P's intertextuality, P, the author of the priestly stratum of the Torah, his intertextuality is in particular when he's describing the priestly garments of the high priest and 
all of that in the context of the exact same motif of the ancient Near East and ancient Israel and late antique Judaism drew from, we have a real clear picture of what his body is like Tarshish mean. That's the point that I was making with the, the paper that Harvard Theological Review accepted and that Professor Eliav acknowledged the correctness of there, his body is like Tarshish describes the God of Israel's blue black body. And there is a full stream of Jewish tradition that helps us to understand that blue black body through a speculum that, that shines. The black body is described as the speculum that doesn't shine. The spirit, the light body of God shines through the black body. The black body being the speculum that does not shine, producing this blue iridescence, which is the blue robe of the high priest. That is what is behind his body is like Tarshish. Now, there is so much. This is not an isolated strand, a sectarian strand of Jewish thought. It is found across so many Jewish literatures. So I wanted to get in the, in the context of theological racial justice, hmm. what being that that is so prevalent in Jewish tradition and being that on the other end of that, Jewish tradition authored the lie that the skin of black people is the result of a curse by God while esoterically in the whisper transmitting the truth that God himself has black skin, a black body. Well, for, for, firstly, we're rolling. I, I, I don't like to roll too many things together because it's hard for me to answer from I have different responses for different things. Um, but firstly, is that the, the Torah never suggests that all black people are the cursed or from from Ham. Um, oh, the Torah never says that. That is correct. Well, let, well, well, no, let me even be correct because the Talmud doesn't say that. It does speak about the descendants of Ham and Canaan who did have certain uh, afflictions with, I believe it was uh, black burnt skin and other parts of their body that were afflicted. And I just want to say two things. According to Jewish tradition and rabbinic texts based on Talmudic uh, knowledge, the, the people of this curse aren't even alive anymore. So that, that curse has already had been off the planet uh, from a, even from the time of a thousand years ago when my Maimonides writing in Spain was already suggesting that these people weren't around anymore. Secondly, you'll see other rabbinic texts that speak about Shame, who was a black and, and beautiful uh, person. And so, so you'll see that if, if you're trying to suggest that we think that mm -hmm. just because basically we say if Ham had certain uh, descendants who were, had curse and part of that curse had dark skin. We also see dark skin being re referenced by people who are not Ham, who are beautiful. So it must be something else is going on with what you're saying here. But I just want to throw that out there. So there are rabbinic texts who would, who would, uh, who would say dark skin is a beautiful color and on the Shemitic people and not on, on the Hamitic people. So that was one thing. Um, and uh, I forgot what I was even going to say before because you went, you jumped to another topic already. So I forgot what, you, what I was going to respond before. So can you see that? Can you can you see that? Yeah. Dr. the Harold Brackman of the Simon Weisenthal Center. There is no denying that the Babylonian Talmud was the first source to read a Negrophobic content into the episode found in the Torah of Noah and Ham. The curse of Ham is not in the Torah. The curse of Ham was authored. Well, no, first of all, the curse is in the Torah. It's just that the, 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 the definition of the curse is in the Talmud. The just Talmud teaches that blacks are cursed black. Not so that's where I'm, that's where I'm trying to say he they, whoever wrote this is generalizing when he says the word blacks with a s at the end to say that all blacks are in this category because you'll even see Moses's wife was referred to as a, as a Kushite as an Ethiopian 
um, and the Torah calls her beautiful. And, and, and that's not from the, you know, from the, let's say from the Hamidic line. So, so I will say there are examples that would contradict from the Torah of what you're trying to suggest or this author is trying to suggest to use the word S at the end of blacks. So then is that to say, so let me get this clear from you. Are you Rabbi Harry? Sure. Are you saying that, so say we grant your claim just now that all blacks, that the Talmud isn't ascribing to all blacks. Yes, of course, that's what I'm saying. But, yeah. but are you, the Talmud described some of these black populations as being black because they are cursed. And that particular Talmudic periscope was used by Jews to justify enslaving black people of West Africa, bring them over here in America. So we then would be that limited population that was cursed black according to the Talmud. Are you prepared to reject the Talmud and in terms of theological racial justice? Are you prepared to condemn the Talmud for its racial injustice in this regard? No, that's like saying to me, that's like saying guns kill. Guns don't kill. Humans kill, you know? So if you had, let's say, let's say, uh, for example, um, you could use the word Jews, but let's, the, the, the Jewish people are scattered on four corners of the earth right now. And now you're speaking about a few small communities of individuals who are involved in the transatlantic slave trade, who took a, something from the Talmud and used that verse to, uh, to rationalize something insane that they did. So, but I'm asking you about the I, I don't need to, Well, no, I don't need to step in and condone the Talmud. I would have to come in and say, you humans mis uh, totally took something from the Talmud and used it to do something so incredibly horrible to another human being that you obviously have to deal with the fact that that happened. Who did that? You know, if if they did, uh, you, you know, how many people try to take something to rationalize their bad behavior to make them feel comfortable in their sin? But so you say, are prepared to condone and support the Talmudic claim that black people, whatever segment of the black population you are saying it refers to, are you right now, Rabbi Harry, saying that you agree with the Talmud that black people, and by all accounts, if it's not all black people, it's the black people in America, who were whose slavery and enslavement and abuse was justified by that Talmudic? No, so let me say it again. That's but, like no, the, but I'm asking you about: Are you saying that the Talmudic claim you agree with the Talmudic claim? Well, I don't think you're saying the Talmudic claim correctly because you use the word "black people" like it's still applicable today. As far as Talmudic Ju Judaism goes, that the people that, that this curse is on aren't even in existence anymore, and that was already ruled one thousand years ago. So, so there's so anyone who is coming up to suggest that there are people who are still part of that curse, they've left the fold of what Rabbinic Judaism has taught or 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 brought down. And like I said, I, I absolutely have no room in my heart for for slavery or people, you know, owning slaves. But you have to look at also the same time slaves were captured by uh, dark-skinned Africans in Africa as well. You know, there is slave, it's still happening today, especially in the Arab slave trade in, in Northern Africa, where I have a lot of friends, you know, in the West Coast of Africa who are telling me what's going on there. And it has nothing to do with white humans, um, you know, using a Talmudic statement. So maybe you had a few Jewish families who used this to make themselves not feel guilty, but the concept of a slave trade and Africans taken into slavery, I think it has nothing to do in its origins with this curse of ham. Um, you know, and, and if it, and if you think that is the exclusive reason for slave trade, I would ask: Are the Arab is the Arabic, you know, Islamic slave trade in Africa today using that also for their r rationale? And then I would come in and tell them, "Hey, guys, you're mi you're misapplying a Talmudic teaching." And I get it; it's easy. It's easy. You want to do that, but there's just no green light for that. Well, if I may, Rabbi, how does your Jewish scholars identify or determine who is black? Earlier, you had mentioned that. 
in the teachings, uh, the Israelites weren't white or black. And I recognize that Dr. Wesley and I are different complexions. I'm clearly darker than him. So oh, such a great what, question. What do you consider I'll tell that? You, I'll tell you what context this conversation was having. This conversation was being had about uh, a lepr leprosy or people in the, in, the, in the Bible, basically, there was such a thing called leprosy where people would have afflictions that would break out on their skin. So it would say a white person would have a black leprosy or a black person would have a white leprosy. There was different colors of leprosies that could happen on a person or um, a white person could have a white leprosy. There was different colors, basically. Um, but they were talking about the shades of skin afflictions and how do we know if that makes a person pure or impure for reasons of entering, entering the temple compounds. So this is why they had to go into saying, let's say your skin is all white. So you say, oh, he's a white guy. But no, that's actually a white leprosy on a white guy. So they, they would talk about this, the shades of people's skins in relation to how the leprosy uh, was appeared on top of it. That's how that came up. But as for Judaism or rabbinic Judaism in the Talmud, no one could really show me a source. There's no such thing as color separating humans or, or being better or worse than anyone. Especially at the peak of, of Talmudic literature, there was people from all colors in, in the fold already. So these weren't racist people. Rabbi Harry, that's interesting. Yes. I, I'm sure you remember this controversy when Israeli Chief Rabbi, Sephardi Chief Rabbi Yitzhak Yosef, uh, during one of his talks, referred to black people as monkeys. What's most interesting about this story to me is the justification that Rabbi Yitzhak Yosef gave. Where everybody is saying, you know, you're wrong, you're racist. The rabbi's office responded like this. He said, I was just quoting the Talmud. He, the rabbi did not apologize for calling black people monkeys. He said through his office, I was only quoting the book. The Talmud is was Did it happen to say book. where where he was quoting from? The article? Because you think it would, right? Yeah. You it, think it, it would say you think it would say the passage that he was quoting. I don't believe it does because I think he was it was taken out of context. I think that the or the first of all, he should have never said that. But he didn't even he didn't mean it to be derogatory. I think it was talking about when you see people, unique people that you're not familiar with seeing, there's certain blessings to say on them. And I, I believe it had something to do with that. But I think an article like that should clearly just show the people where in the Talmud this says, if this is such a bad book, show me where show me where it says no, that. No, but it wasn't the article. This is this yeah. is the key point, Rabbi. Okay. It's Rabbi Yosef's office who said. The rabbi owes no apology. He was only quoting the Talmud. Now, this is the chief. I have great respect for you as a rabbi. You're well, there's nowhere in the Talmud that says black people are monkeys. So I just want to throw that yeah, out there. Yeah, but, but according to Israel's chief Sephardic rabbi, his calling black people monkeys was just him quoting the sacred text of the Talmud. Now, when I hear this from his office, I understand Rabbi Harry. Well, it sounds like you are intent on apologizing for or evading the issue of what clearly is in Talmud and how Talmud, uh, ancient case of the curse of Ham and how it was the springboard. You mentioned the Jewish, I'm sorry, the Arab enslavement of Africans. Those mainly Iranians posing as Arabs, but the Muslims who enslaved Arabs the basis, their theological justification was precisely the theological justification that the Talmud authored. And so you're so saying that these Muslims believe in the Talmud? They, they were happy to receive 
the wisdom of the Talmud. Well, Africans were enslaving Africans that, before that, the Talmud. That Africans, that populations of Africa can be enslaved because they were cursed by God. Well, according to what you're saying, you would but think that the rise of the author that malicious and fraudulent narrative. Well, then I, what I would say is it would seem, according to your logic, that slavery in Africa uh, would would have started to peak post Talmudic times. Um, but that would be quite the opposite. We see slavery was extremely popular prior to the Talmud being written. So, so you know, all of a sudden the Talmud's written, and all of a sudden that this is the reason why it's happening. No, it was happening from ancient Egypt. It was happening all the time and it's happening now. And I don't, I definitely don't agree with you. It's by Iranians because I have a lot of friends in the Western African area and it's literally Nigerians still enslaving Nigerians and doing un unbearable things to them. And it has absolutely nothing to do with the Talmud. But it sounds like you're deflecting. We're not talking no, about- No, I'm not deflecting. I'm just saying that you're trying to generalize. Slavery in Africa. Yeah. We're talking about the Talmud. Well, no, I'm not. Now, you're trying to generalize to say old, that this old case of yeah. Talmud, Talmudic anti-blackness, and then you have a modern well, case. I don't think there's an Talmudic anti-blackness. That's what I'm trying to say. I wouldn't see. I don't. I don't see that in the Talmud, especially because I told you whoever that curse was on isn't even in existence today. And the fact that we refer to Moses's dark-skinned wife as a beautiful person, and there's Jewish literature that refers to the dark-skinned people of shame as beautiful people as well. Rabbeinu Yona, to be correct, is the author. So, so what you're doing is you're taking, you know, you're trying to take like little smoke and trying to turn it into a big fire. And I'm trying to say the way the Jews think is we're very logical people. So if it doesn't survive the test of like logic or reason, it can't be a reality. So when you generalize. I'm saying, wait a minute. There's too many things that you're trying to you're trying to skip levels and come to conclusions that it, it is not. It doesn't have a foundation. With with due respect, Rabbi sure. Harry, when I'm, you I'm, say, I'm me to you as well. So I'm sorry if I'm getting out of line. I'm sorry. I said due respect to me to you as well. I apologize if I'm getting out of line. No, not out of line. All oh, this uh, most necessary conversation. I, I when you say there's no anti-blackness in the Talmud, yet the Talmud authors the lie that the children, that Hamedic people are black skin because God cursed them. You say there's no anti-blackness there when we have the chief Sephardic rabbi today. Well, that- call it, what what I'm saying. Let, me, let me finish this thought. Let me finish this different, thought. Okay. Because I'm showing the consistency. But that's not where he pulled it from. Those are two different, completely different teachings in the Talmud. And one of them had nothing to do with the other. No, but but that so makes trying my to say point. He pulled it that, that makes my point. You have well, at least two different strands of anti-blackness. But I could show you five strands of pro-blackness also. So now what? Well, does, does one cancel each other out? So the Talmud is written in tremendous depth and wisdom and to decode it and to understand it and to understand the context of when something or what something was said in, you'd have to be a, a tremendous Talmudic scholar. So to see something in the Talmud and then to make a generalization, it, 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 you know, it's it's not going to really stand I'm not, in the, I'm, in the, I'm not yeah. making the generalization when the chief Sephardi rabbi describes black people as monkeys and his excuse it his justification was i read it i got it i'm just quoting the talmud then i think he in this matter him versus you his position is clear the anti-blackness that most people got upset with him about he only got it from the Talmud. Now, I would imagine there is no, you would contend there is no anti Jesusness in the Talmud, even though the Talmud has Jesus languishing and boiling excrement. The fact of the matter is, the in terms of theological racial justice, if 
so many racial, if it can be said that the relationship between blacks and Jews is informed by what? such thinking that's shaped by these Talmudic paracodes, these Talmudic traditions, then I think you, Rabbi Harry, in the spirit of racial justice, as so many Jews would have black people answer for what the honorable brother Minister Farrakhan said. And he has been imprisoned socially in a false and malicious charge of anti-Semitism. When the Honorable Brother Minister Farrakhan speaks a truth that may be uncomfortable or offensive to certain Jewish persons, invariably they give black people the Farrakhan litmus test. They make black people speak to and condemn what the Honorable Brother Minister Farrakhan said and distanced themselves from him, while at the same time, there's this profound stream of anti-Blackness in authoritative Jewish sources. But right. there's an yeah. apologia for yeah. Jewish anti-Blackness. And so I'm saying that if we are going to, if the discussion is going to be about black anti-Semitism, we have to candidly address Jewish anti-blackness and the authoritative stream of it, which okay. has to yeah. be the Talmud in so many cases. Right. So... Let me let me just to reclarify because I pulled it up here because I remember looking at this once and how this was story told me is completely being taken out of context. Um, so I'm going to read it over here. So it says in the Talmud, there's certain things that when you see, you make a blessing on them, right? One of the things in the Talmud that it says you make a blessing on is when you see uh, a person with a dark skin from Africa, you make a blessing. Which is kind of cool. I don't. It sounds kind of crazy, but it's kind of cool. Um, so here's here's the conversation. So the rabbi is giving a lecture, and he's going through this Talmudic piece, and it says, when you see a black person, you have to make this blessing. So I'm I'm reading quote unquote from Ynet, which is a major Jewish source of news, who did this uh, research to clarify. So the rabbi quote unquote said, so we don't bless every kushi, which means uh, you know could be used as a derogatory term, but it literally as the Torah uses kushite, someone from Africa, like the like it refers to Moses' wife as kush, kushite. So he says you don't bless everyone you see when you walk in the streets of America. Every five minutes you see a, a black person. Are you going to deliver the give every single person a blessing? He said no. That's not what the Talmud was referring to happening. It didn't say you bless every black person you see. When do you bless a black person? You bless one when it, the mother and the father are white. So he quote, I'm quoting him, quote, unquote. He says, when the mother or father are white and they give birth to a black person, that person gets a blessing. And that's what the, Gemara, that's what the Talmud said. And so, and so then he said, quote, unquote, if you know, however you know, that a monkey son came forth from them. And so I guess he did use the word monkey very inappropriately to refer to a black person. But when they clarified with his office, it said, why not obtain the response from Yosef's office? which noted that the Talmud uses the example of a black person to explain appropriate uses of the blessing of differentiated and also mentions monkeys in th certain things that get blessings. So the two were mentioned in, in alongside other rare things that a human would see. However, the passage cited does not compare black children to monkeys. Instead, it appears to list differentiated creatures that would require a blessing, including black people, elephants, and monkeys. Additionally, the use of the term kusha is normative in the Talmud, but no longer employed, you know, as, as a normal text. So basically what I'm saying is <coughs> the Talmud has a law that if there's two white humans and they gave birth to a black person, that black person gets a blessing. That's really what it all was saying. So there's nowhere in there you could really look and pull out racism. You could have a racist person, perhaps, like I said, the, the guns don't 
don't kill. The, hu the person kills. So if you show me someone who misapplied something from the Talmud, I will say, let's go to the integrity of the teaching. Let's look at the verse. Since the first time I got on the phone with you, I'm all about the source. Let's look at the actual thing. We're talking about everything, but actually what's written in the Talmud. We're talking about how he, he, humans apply it. And I'll agree with you. If someone's going to misapply it, like if someone's going to start a slave ship company and he's going to be like, oh, you're cursed so I could do it, I'd be like, you are totally not in sync with reality. You need to take a step back. Like, whoa, no way. So is Jesus boiling an excrement, Rabbi Harry? Well, like I said again, that you have to understand the Talmud. Oh, oh, this, oh, clear. this is this is the source. Well, the Talmud also has things that says that this man was riding on the back of a whale that was the size of a continent and jumped off the back of the whale and landed on another whale. So let's say X percent of the Talmud is written in allegory. This would be an example in allegory. The Talmud, we're not a metaphysical people really. Like we're down, we're very down to earth and scientific. If it says someone is in hell burning in, in something of excrement, that is referring to something that is way beyond the physical realm of someone actually sitting in a pot of excrement or, or semen. But yeah, whatever the Talmud said about this person, and there was a few different people named that name in the Talmud, so we don't know. But whoever that is, is in some dark place right now. And it per perhaps, I don't know. But um, but whatever yeah, it was, but, but whatever but, it was, the the Talmud is written in allegory. That I could for sure say a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. When it's called uh, the Agada, the Agadot, the the legends, the stories, the tales. So you'll read some of the Talmud. You say, how does the Talmud say that this person jumped from Earth, landed in the sky, took something, came back? So so it, it can't literally be taken at its literal value. And if someone thinks that everything, actually it says, if someone thinks that the stories of the Talmud are taken at its literal value, he's they, you know he's a he's a fool. But if someone doesn't believe the stories of the Talmud, he's a he's a, a denier of God. So you hear what I'm saying? Let me say that again. If someone believes the stories of the Talmud as literal stories, he's a fool. If someone doesn't believe the validity in the stories of the Talmud, he's a denier of God. So try to just make sense of what that means. Mm -hmm. So just as we call Michael Hoffman says, the few Christians or Muslims are aware that in the Babylonian Talmud, Jesus shares his place in hell with the Roman Titus who is depicted as being chastised for destruction of the temple eternity. I'll tell you Dr. how to understand Hoffman, Talmud, Dr. right? Hoffman, Dr. Hoffman acknowledges the very point right. or I'll tell you, I'll tell you. You just offered that right. it's a different Jesus, but he goes on and documents that it's Jesus of Nazareth that is being referred to as being boiled in next criminal. And the reason this is important, we're talking about black Jewish relationships where the nature of black Jewish relationships. If well, what does Jesus have to do with the black Jewish relationship? Oh. Jesus has everything to do. What are your thoughts on Messiah, Rabbi Harry? Well, first of all, my thoughts in general is I think it's crazy that someone was taken out of Africa, brought on ships to America, and told to believe in Jesus, and still in 2020 does believe in Jesus. That sounds very strange to me. I would be very shady or shaded out if like, my religion that I'm believing in today was taught to me by, by slave traders. Um, but that's, you know, but you want to just repeat your question for a second? Wow. Yeah. One, let me agree with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's why I'm wondering, what does Jesus have to do with the whole thing? Jesus is, you know, a white, Roman, pagan-infused culture that hijacked the biblical narrative and, you know, did horrible things to humans for the last 2,000 years to try to spread their message. Um, it's kind of interesting now because you look at the islands of Indonesia and they're talking about King David and the Redeemer that's going to come one day. So I guess the story of David and, and, a, and a Redeemer, Mashiach, Messiah, that one, one day will come is now information to billions of people in the world because of this, you know, backwards uh, uh, Christian uh, theology. But uh, from a Kabbalistic perspective, we do have an explanation and understanding of how, of how it had to have happened that way or why the world unfolded that way. But my understanding of a Mashiach 
is that basically there's, from the Kabbalistic understanding, there's a part of everyone's brain that since the time of Adam and Eve has been locked or shut down. And in the Messianic era, all humans reopen that. And there's a figure called the Mashiach, the Messiah, who helps activate that process to reopen the minds of people where they will one day be you know, in a state of consciousness. So that's, from a Jewish perspective, really what we think about the Mashiach. So let me be real clear. I'm not talking about the fabricated white Jesus. Okay. The Christianity as a white man's religion that you just eloquently described, and I would agree with you. The 2020, 2020 black people have no justification for participating in slave religion. So jettisoning or well, you could say the same about Islam. You absolutely can. The Arabized version. I think Jews were the only one who didn't hurt anyone to believe in what they wanted to believe in, but I, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. No, the Hasmonians forced conversion. In their land? It uh, doesn't matter where it is. Forced conversion is forced conversion. Now, the, the relevance of the Messiah or Jesus, I'm not talking about the fabricated white Jesus, I'm talking about the authentic Jesus, both historic and prophetic. The historic Jesus was black because the Levantines were black people. The Semites were black people. So the historical well, Jesus at his time, the black. Judeans were multicolored. Well, way, we're going to look at that. that. We, we, we're happy to look at that. Yeah. But the historic Jesus and then the prophetic Jesus. What does this matter to black people? Um, Brother Warren, will you kill that clip, please? Well, while we cue the clip, make sure to share everybody. This is quite the conversation. I hope everyone has their learning hats on. I know I do. A beautiful chalice. chalice. Silver. Yes. In a cup that the chalice is placed in. Get the picture. <laughs> Two Jewish rabbis. Stayed for hours downstairs in the lobby of our hotel. And they came upstairs finally. Mr. Harry Belafonte was in my suite. We were talking. And the Jewish rabbis gave me this. And believe me, I people give me stuff. But I was so dumb, I, I, I didn't know what this is, you know. But I went home and I read the words yes, sir. to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. You are the Messiah of the world. Look at this. And you are the Messiah to every human who wants to be civilized. Now, Jesus is very important to black people and it's very important to identify Jesus, the Messiah. I heard from you on one occasion, Rabbi Harry, that you believe or sound like I was hearing from you 
that you would anticipate the coming of two messiahs, as was <laughs> an early biblical tradition that it sounds like you agree with the anticipation of the coming of two messiahs. I share that outlook with you and identifying the messiahs are very important. And I would even go so far as to suggest that the only way to properly identify the Messiah singular and the Messiah's plural is to identify who the children of Israel are. Would you agree with that? That the proper identification of Messiah is predicated upon the proper identification of the children of Israel? Yeah, but, uh, you know, we, the Messiah is from a direct line from King David. So for sure, it is a direct male after male after male from King David. So whoever the Messiah is going to be will have to be from the line of King David. Mm -hmm. Now, we know there's a long Jewish, a long Arab, and I'm sure others, tradition of fabricating genealogies. So well, while I well, that's a claim, I don't know the basis in, to that claim on Jews fabricating genealogy. Oh, we have oh, at, there is there was you know what the term exilarch is? Yeah. Exilarch was uh, a diaspora leader for the Jewish people from the house of King David. They ruled until about the year one thousand and, and all the way into Babylon. There was always Someone who represented the house of David to the Jewish people um, is exilarch, E X I L A R C H. Um, and so, you know, even when the Talmud was written, we were very, we weren't like put, you know, hiding under the rug when there was Roman converts or Greek converts. There was no shame in that. But we also had a system of, of priests and, and et cetera that um, I, I'm not sure where there's a fabrication in the whole thing. That's yeah. what I'm trying to say. There's tremendous fabrication and documented fabrication, starting with the sacred text itself. Tekun Seferun, the, when the Holy Quran calls out the party from among the Jews who heard the word of God and altered the word of God, fabricating words of God, that's not a Muslim anti-Semitic trope. The Tikkun Soferim or the emendations of the scribes, those places where in the scripture, Ezra and the great Sanhedrin or the great synagogue acknowledges altering the word of God, changing the word of God according to their own taste. So if rabbis, if rabbinic tradition acknowledges fabricating the words of God, then certainly we aren't incredulous with the idea of rabbis fabricating human genealogies. Well, but I think course, that's a far stretch right there of logic. But you see, when Ezra and Nehemiah came back, they, it lists the names of the families, their last names, which ones were priests. It goes into tremendous detail of preserving the lineage of, of everyone. And let me ask you a question. Like, yeah. if, if you got a guy like Ezra and Nehemiah who, <clears throat> who wanted to just be like, you know, this is the Torah, this is what we got. Do you think they would record or write down the fact that they edited the text or, or changed it to their liking? That would have been something they left out and they would have said, this is it. Because Ezra and Nehemiah were, were on the trans, trans, transmission of keeping this information alive. So they didn't, they didn't want to, they didn't, they didn't have to say anything. But what I think the texts are saying is they had to take different texts that had nuances in them and get to the bottom of what the accurate text was. And that's a process that's been happening for thousands of years. I have a totally different understanding from the text because the various rabbinic discussions of the emendations of the scribes, the tekun soferim, they give different numbers. And 
But what is in general agreement was the changes that were made were made because the great synagogue found distasteful the scriptural descriptions of God anthropomorphically, God in his human form. So Ezra and those who followed him took the liberty to change the words of scripture in order to change the nature of God. It is not in, not only the nature of God was amended by Jewish scribes, <laughs> but the name of God was amended by Jewish scribes. If Jewish scribes had not amended the text, of scripture, had not taken liberties and sought to conform God's word to their own taste. See, it's not just about halakha, Jewish law, where Jewish rabbis beat their chest at having defeated God. But even theologically, where God said it, described himself in scripture one way, but Jewish scribes found God's self description tasteful and therefore changed or amended it. That's law, that's theology. And so when the Honorable Brother Minister Farrakhan on July 4th said that COVID 19 was a pandemic from heaven called down by Jewish fabrication of the word of God, he was and is not being anti-Semitic. He is stating a scriptural and historical fact of Jewish scribes fabricating the word of God, altering the word of God according to their own taste. So the Messiah, identifying the Messiah is very critical to the well-being of black people. And in order to properly identify the Messiah, of course, we have to properly identify the children of Israel because it's from among the children of Israel that the Messiah emerges. And the reason certain Jewish circles have been so angry with the Honorable Brother Minister Farrakhan, it is not because he has ever been anti-Semitic. It is because he has been proclaiming since at least 1984 that Jews are not the chosen people of God. Jews are not the fulfillers of the scripture prophesying enslavement for 400 years, after which God will come and liberate Israel from their oppression. That is not a reference to Ashkenazi Jews in Israel or in Eastern Europe. The Honorable Brother Minister Farrakhan has said in it can be proven in no limit of time that that scripture refers to the black man and woman in America. So the issue of the chosen people of God, the issue of the true children of Israel gets at the heart of the discussion who is Messiah. That's why it's important to black people. Okay, I mean, from my understanding, the children of Israel were scattered to four corners of the world. Um, they were one of the locations they were sent to was Babylon, where they stayed there with record. You know, you see the graves of prophets still there, the graves of Esther, where they've stayed there till about the year 1000, 11 or the year 1100. Um, from there, 
you still had Jews from Spain from the time of the Roman temple, uh, the Romans destroying the temple of Israel, all the way to down the Silk Road to Afghanistan. And then you see the the center of Torah study and the, the Jewish people migrate from Babylon to the Mediterranean coastal cities, to you know Italy, uh, Spain, they go to France. Um, you don't really see the emergence of the Ashkenaz Jewry becoming popular, um, you know, for a few hundred years after that. So when you say who are the real children of Israel, I would suggest the people who've been historically saying they were for the last, you know, two or so thousand years from the time of the exile. Which exile? Well, you have uh, the original exile when the Israelite. Well, there's lots of waves of exile. Let's just say that. Because you got the exile of the ten tribes who went to the far east in Afghanistan, and now if you if you go to Afghanistan, you have the Pashtun, which I'm sure you may have seen me speak about in my other lectures. Fifty million people who refer to themselves as Bani Israel from the Quran that they would be we are the Bani Israel, we are the children of Israel. They're practicing the law of Moses as far as Levirate marriage, cities of refugee, eighth day circumcision. Um, they have customs and traditions, so they're saying that they're the children of Israel, which is interesting. But I was referring specifically to the exile of uh, the, the returnees from the Babylonian exile with Ezra and Nehemiah, who established the second commonwealth in Israel. And then from there, who went into exile again, sold into slavery into Africa, sold into slavery in Rome, uh, spread throughout the Mediterranean cities as slaves. And still till today, you have two different groups. You have the groups of the people who held on to the halakha and the Israelites who were scattered, who didn't have law, who may have been serving idols at the time of scattering. But the prophecy doesn't just refer to Jews of the diaspora. Globally. The opposite it refers to the, the both of them coming back together. No, but the Judeans and the, and the Israelites. But I'm speaking of the prophecy of enslavement in Egypt for 400 years and the exodus that followed God's redemption of that people the people who were in bondage for 400 years, as a result of which, God himself, the God of Israel. Well, let me ask a hypothetical question. I'm sorry? Um, I'm going to ask a hypothetical question to you. Uh, you hear me okay? Yeah. I can okay, great. Uh, also, you'll see the same prophecies that say, well, my children will come back from the Far East, from the North, from the South, from the East. Okay, that's one thing. But let's say... The, this prophecy in Deuteronomy is speaking about the transatlantic slave trade uh, of bringing Africans to America. Does that mean that anyone who didn't come on those ships wouldn't be Israel? That's the question I'm asking. They did, they did not come to America? Or, or didn't get taken on slave ships. They're still where they were in Africa, the same place for a thousand years. If they didn't get taken from their city or there, does that exclude them from being from the children of Israel, according to your theory? So, I I'll tell you why it's relevant. There. No, my answer is yes. I separate because I believe history, genetics, and scripture warrants the separation between three different concepts: ancient Israelites and their progeny, which I believe. I agree with you. You can trace the progeny, descendants of ancient Israelites in many places in the world, including Africa, Igbo, Limba, including India, Bane Israel, and including Pashtun. Israelites different from Jews, right? From Judea and both of those are to be distinguished from the fulfillers of the prophecy of the children of Israel as recorded in Exodus. And so while there are Israelites, authentic Israelites in Nigeria, absolutely. But no, they absolutely don't fit into the prophecy of the chosen people so, being enslaved for 400 years in a land that is not there. They're still in their land. 
But so this particular you... people, the children of Israel, from whom the Messiah will be born, that people is enslaved for 400 years. There is no people, Rabbi Harry, and I will close and let you engage this. There is no people. There is no recorded incidents of any human population who has been enslaved in a foreign land for 400 years. No Ashkenazi group, no Sephardic group of Jews have any history of such. So being in no Igbo who are still in Nigeria or Limbo who's still in... Well, let, let, me ask, let me ask you this question then. Because mm -hmm. um, first of all, I never went on record saying that I don't believe that the people of the transatlantic slave trade could have been fulfilling that verse of biblical prophecy. So I'm not even saying that because that could be very you, well are realistic you, to you me. Agree that they but, are. What I, but what I want to ask you is this, because the power of discernment is so important in these conversations. So are you trying to say... If you didn't get taken on the slave trade on those ships to the Americas, then you are not from the Judean people? Is that what you're saying? No, I, I just distinguish between three concepts. God, the power of discernment is necessary and also the power to appreciate nuance is important too. Now, I just said, Rabbi Harry, I distinguish for a reason. Three groups. Israelites, Judeans, and the children of Israel. I said that they are three different entities. You have scriptural sources for these. And so three you entities? are asking me about Judeans when you in a number. Well, I'm asking of you for a scripture. Do you have scriptural sources yes. to to yes. say that there's a difference between a Judean and a chosen person of God? Well. The Judeans, I am saying, the chosen person of God, yes, the scripture is Genesis. And, and, and the scripture is saying specifically no this one doesn't include that one? This is the scripture. This is scripture. Know of a surety, Abraham, your seed will be in a land that is not there, will be a stranger in the land that is not theirs. They will serve them. They will be afflicted 400 years. Okay. After that time, I will come. I will judge that nation from which, which they have served. And afterwards, would they come out with great substance? That prophecy defines the chosen people of God. Being from Judea. Says, says who? Where did you just pull that out? You 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 read the verse, but then you threw in its what seemed like your own self explanation at the end that that verse means if if you were in that category, then you were from the chosen people of Israel, well, and if you're not in that category, you're not chosen. That seemed well, like well, something that's not in the text. Well, well, I guess the question, the relevant question, is chosen for what? Mm. I guess or, the relevant question is chosen. Well, for not what? even. Where's the word chosen come right, from? Yeah. Uh, that that it's right know, here. After that time, I will come, God talking, I will come, I will judge that nation that you served for 400 years, and afterwards, you shall come out with great substance. That nation that was a slave for 400 years, chosen for what? Chosen to be visited by God, chosen to have their oppressors judged and chosen to come out of that experience with great substance. That's the choosing that I'm talking about. So you're what you're doing is you're, you're self-interpreting a verse. So you're saying when the verse says they will go free with great wealth, that implies that they are the exclusive people, uh, chosen people of Israel. No. So we're not trying to exclusive people of Israel. They are... It's, it's, you're mixing your opinion with, with verse over here, so I'm trying to get to the bottom of what's verse well, well, opinion. On. But but let's be real clear. Nothing that has occurred in these two hours we've been conversing has been other than Rabbi Harry sharing his opinion and Dr. Wesley sharing his opinion. 
Well, please, no, that's no, the difference. Don't make the mistake. To I think. don't have my own opinion here on the matter. That's what I'm no, trying to say. That's that's a charade with due respect, Rabbi. Harry. How would you say so? I, I when the everything I say is is from a source that's from a generation prior to me. Except it's not. Except it's Rabbi Harry quoting his understanding of the source. That's all it is. No, I'm literally telling you exactly what they said very clear. Well, no, and then you interpret. You interpret it, and you interpret different from the Sephardic. Well, I, do, I do very little interpreting, so I, I usually don't come out here and say what this verse that's is very, referring to that, that, or what that he, verse is referring to. This candidate, that's very arrogant, Rabbi Harry, with due respect. Well, I'm trying to be confident think, in what I'm saying over here. Well, well, but let's be real clear. I am sane enough to acknowledge that what I'm offering is my understanding, my opinion, even though it's followed by all of these credentials. That don't matter. It's my opinion. Now, if you want us to believe that I'm over here offering opinion, and you are in Jerusalem offering authoritative doctrine. Well, that's very arrogant. That's I, I, it is. All you are doing, Rabbi Harry, is offering Rabbi Harry's understanding of this. And that's why we invited you. We want your well. Time out. You're you're kind of flipping the thing on me right now. I, I, I'm trying to say to you because we have to look at the text. You're reading a text, and at the end of the text, you're letting me know what you think that text means. So if you if, if you tell me where I'm doing that, I'd love to address how, every single thing I say. Like I have to say where this information for me is coming from. So when I want to know, you know, something about your end, I want to know: Is this something you were taught by someone? Or is it something that you thought of on your own? So is it your thought on your own that the only people who are chosen people of Israel are the people who were on this slave trade because you looked at the verse and the Igbo people who are genuine Israelites aren't included in that. You've right. come up with this reality that excluded 40 million people in Nigeria from being the children of Israel because of your understanding of a verse. I, absolutely not. That is not what or I... Or chosen never, children of Israel, right, that is. Right. And I... Gave the details of what I meant by the chosen people of God, the children of Israel who served 400 years. Now, Rabbi Harry, I never delegitimate the Igbo as authentic descendants of Israelites. In fact, but I'm you're making a differentiation. I made a differentiation between ancient Israelites. And Judeans, and it's very with do, Rabbi Harry. We can pull up your discussion, your admonition to your audience to distinguish between Israelites and Judeans. Well, that that's, very, that's based on the verse. That's not my understanding. Right. No, but the point is so now all of a sudden you have a problem with me distinguishing between the Israelites of the north and the Judeans of the south. They are no, different. I don't. I didn't say anything there. There's clearly a difference based on the okay. verses well, of the well, Israelites well, that's of the, the north. Point I made about here. That's yeah. why I distinguished three. Well, I think the point you were making was that the children who went on these ships are the chosen children of Israel. And if you weren't on the ships, you're not. That's what I'm trying no, to get you to talk point. about. Right. That's your point. Well, I'm kind of asking you what your point is. So I'm trying to right. get your. I'm giving you the answer, Rabbi. Okay, so I'm going to step back and listen again. Let me hear right. what it please, is. Please do. Yes. The I said, and I'm going to say again, and please recall, I said this that I distinguish between three entities Israelites, Judeans, and the children of Israel who fulfills the specific prophecy of Genesis. Now, I said, Rabbi Harry, that in terms of the first group, the Israelites, I said that I bear witness that the Igbo of Nigeria, they, the genetics, the religious tradition, 
indicates that they are a remnant, an authentic remnant of the Israelites. They are authentically Israelite. I said that the limba in Southern Africa, the genetics, the religious tradition indicate they are a legitimate remnant of the Israelites. I mentioned- Of Judeans. The limba is unique from the Imba because they actually trace back to ancient uh, Yemenite. Fine. The better, the, the, the better Israel of India, the black Jews of India. Mm. All of these, I said, have are authentic remnants of Israel. I distinguish those Israelites from the Judeans. And by Judeans, what do I mean, Judean? I know that the population of Judea, by the time the Assyrians invaded the land, it was heterogeneous. The Lachis remains, both the scriptural remains and the skeletal remains, so that there was that the indigenous black Levantines, the Levantines were black, the Canaanites, the original people of that area were black, the Natufians, the Natufians, they are black people. The original people of the land of Palestine are black people. And so when the, when the Hyksos were kicked out of Egypt, and Manetho and Josephus bears witness that these Hyksos established data in Palestine. These were these northern Caucasus area peoples, not unlike the Amorites in terms of ethnicity, though they were a different group culturally, but they established Judah. And these Judeans, these white folks, these whites who gave birth are a nucleus of what would become asking Nazi Jews, though most asking Nazi Jews are European, have no relation to Canaan. But the but the nucleus, the genetics traces a nucleus, a minuscule nucleus of ancestry from the Middle East, those are the Judeans. They are different from the black Israelites. But those are two groups and I distinguish them from the, and the diaspora, the Jewish diaspora broadly defined. If you include in that both Israelite and Judean remnants, the Jewish diaspora is different from the fulfillers of the prophecy of Genesis. That's my point. That does not de, I never delegitimated the Igbo or Limba as true, authentic Israel. You just said they weren't the chosen, the chosen no. people. No, I said they were not the fulfillers of the prophecy of Genesis. That's what I Pretty said. Pretty sure you threw the word chosen people in there somewhere. And, but... I, and, I, and I gave an explanation of what I meant by chosen. Chosen for what? Chosen to be visited by God. Chosen for their oppressors to be judged by God. And chosen to be brought out by God with great substance. That's the choice that I very clearly articulate. Um, and I am saying that, that the fulfillers of that prophecy are the black man and woman in America. And when God visited that people, the fulfillers of that scripture, no. The fulfillers of that scripture, by definition, can't still be in their land in Nigeria. They well, can't me, be in their land me, in South Africa. Let me Africa. circle back again, because like I said, I never 
never denied the fact that the people on those ships may have been from the children of Israel. So I remember my point of contention being with you is what makes these people chosen versus other people? That was my original question I asked for you and you addressed it. Um, but secondly, I think you and I have a completely different understanding of what a Judean is. <clears throat> when I think of Judea, I'm thinking of the Judean kingdom uh, where the Temple of Solomon was and then the Second Commonwealth where they had a temple again. Um, I don't see a period where there was some type of swap where white guys came in and swapped out with the real Judeans who were there from the time of Ezra and Nehemiah who built that. Uh, what you do see is, as redacted in the history books, is at the time of actual Judeans, people from the house of King David living in the land, there was Roman and Greek converts at the same time as well. So there was no hijacking of anything, but there was this thing called halacha or the Torah, which is very clear to allow converts, people graft themselves in. And not only does the Torah allow you to graft yourself in, it says you can't even separate or differentiate between a man who grafts himself in. He's called Israel. He gets the inheritance of Israel put on him. So the Torah is so specific to not differentiate between a human who is of the bloodline of Israel and who's not of the bloodline of Israel as being part of the house of Israel. But um, from my understanding of the scriptures, you have two groups. You got the group, you know, actually, I'm going to pull up a, a great verse over here. Um, you have, you obviously, you have the groups of Israel. And uh, first of all, it says in Ezekiel, it says when they, 47, 22, when they shall divide the land for an inheritance and unto the strangers that sojourn amongst you, who shall beget children amongst you, they shall be unto you as the homeborn amongst the children of Israel. They have an inheritance with you amongst the tribes of Israel. So we see verses all throughout the, the Torah, you know, unifying these type of people. Um, but there's one more verse I want to say. It says, uh, you know, in the future, <clears throat> uh, two verses, if you don't mind me. It says Samuel 1, 16, 7, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not unto his countenance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For it is not as man see it. For man look on the outward appearance, but the Lord look on the heart. And then, you know, we see in Isaiah, another thing it says, um, In the future, when the tribes of Israel return, it says, One shall say, I am the Lord's. And another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. And another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. So you see that there are different groups of people that in the future will claim and return and come back. So I would I would think it's very likely if you have the children of Israel in, in, in Nigeria, the Igbo people, um, but, you know, who would self-identify with that. And then you got the transatlantic slave trade who brought people here. So what in their right mind is, is not say, connecting the dots and saying, hey, wait a, wait a minute, I'm calling myself the children of Israel. But the, the ships that literally took me from this port, they're also calling themselves the children of Israel. But there's something in my mind that's going to want to make me not build with them or work with them or be something else aside from them. So, yeah, you see there are different categories of the children of Israel, but I don't think we see anywhere of which one's chosen or not. Yeah, we're playing different missions, but how could you tell me you see them? You see them in Africa, you see them in India, you see them in Afghanistan. You look at all over the world, you see them. But once you start seeing them in Europe, oh, all of a sudden, there's some, you know, there was a swap out between some people who took the name Judah and put it on them and stole it. So that that just to me seems like it's someone trying to create division or to being divisive and saying, you know, putting people in separate categories where they can't build together. No. Can it's my slide display can you see yeah. no the point isn't that people can't build together i'm talking about a nation of people a brotherhood a, 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 a tribe the people of israel that's what i'm speaking about i'm not speaking about neighbors getting together i'm speaking about the ingathering of the people of israel and then for one person to come and say, based on the verse, these are the people of Israel and these people aren't, that, that to me seems like that's not going to get anywhere. But when you come to say, hey, look, these people say they are, and these people say they are, and these people say they are, why aren't all those three people in the same room having a conversation about you know, you know, stopping wars and making world peace? Right. No. And that's, that's the value I see in this narrative of the lost tribes of Israel. So I have a sensitivity when people try, when there's an attempt to separate the tribes from uniting somehow. But we must unite on the basis of fact and truth. 
Rabbi. Well, I, I think that if you make that a theological topic of conversation, then it's then it's going to not get anywhere either. Let's say me and a few tribal leaders get in a room. I got I got Afghanistan at the table. I got Igbo at the table. I got a few tribes at the table. We're all talking, and we're going to spend about five hours debating the nature of God has skin or not. And meanwhile, there's kids getting kidnapped across the world and some wars on oil and some you know they're polluting the oceans. We're going to say, you know what? I got an idea. Let's fix some of these issues together as a team. And then when the whole world kind of chills out in this world peace, we'll sit down for a cup of tea and a cup of coffee and we'll have this conversation about does God have skin or does God not have skin? Right. Or who are the people from whom the Messiah is to be born? Oh, I have a good and answer for that. Well, well, that was rhetorical. Um, that's oh. my way of answering. It's speculation on your end uh, as of now, I guess, right? Your, I'm answering your concern. I'm oh, okay. This. I was saying if someone is certain that someone's the Messiah today, I would just say that's pure speculation. Well, but see, this is, but you're making my point. This is why it's necessary to go through these points, to put the facts on the table, which will allow us to clear the table of non-facts. And then once all we have on the table is facts, we can look at it and see if we can make an assessment based on these facts of who the Messiah is. All productive conversation must start with the facts. And Can so, I ask you a question? Yes. Are you trying to say that because Minister Farrakhan was a descendant of the transatlantic slave trade, it puts him in a category to be eligible to be a messiah? Oh, well, yes. I'm At bottom, I'm saying that, but I'm saying much more than that. But yes, the logic you, you just articulated is applicable. Yes. Okay, because I'm, I'm trying to get to the bottom of things over here. Well, um, so, uh, so what I'm trying... Oh. What was that? Well, uh, me too, because I'm now I'm I'm really curious that if it's speculation about uh, who the next well, Messiah is going to be, if Rabbi uh, Jews honored Minister Louis Farrakhan announcing that he is uh, a Messiah, <laughs> and now I'm put, you can't put the word S after Jew when when this conversation is happening though, because the Jews didn't do anything. Two rabbis, I don't know if they're a conservative reform rabbi, where they got their. If, you know, so the Jews There's never voted. There's not consensus on this. Absolutely then. not. I'll tell you the Jewish perspective on the matter, and this is the official position that the Jewish people have have held and will hold, is that the Messiah, according to scriptures, has three basic fundamental tasks that have to happen in the Messianic era: is bring world peace. You know, we're going to put our weapons into the ground, into the plowshares. We're going to build a temple for all people, a place where all humans are going to come and pray. A beti kare the kolamim, a house where all nations will call their house, and world uh, and uniting the tribes of Israel. Those are the three things. So the Jewish people say, until those three things happen, it's complete speculation. In every generation, there could be a candidate. There could be someone who could have been the Messiah of that generation, a messianic candidate. But until one human does those three, we're doing a tremendous disarm to the messianic process to try to put it on a person. Let's say that, let's say, and this happened, false messiahs in the past were very common. Let's say this guy's the, the messiah, you know, we're hyping him up, the messiah. God, God forbid he dies and there's still war and suffering in the world. So what, we're waiting for him to come back? It's like, no. You know what the, the most dangerous thing about calling someone a messiah is? It doesn't leave room for any young kid to believe he could be the messiah and go out there for the world peace. So it's like... So it's like, for me, it has to be, this is complete speculation. Um, it's not based on anything that's actually happening in the, in the symbols that the Torah will, that the, the scriptures will say is an indicator of a messianic era. So by all means, if, if at the end of the day, Mr. Farrakhan turns out to be uh, the honorable, I, I'm, I apologize, I don't even know how he should be addressed. I want to give him respect he deserves because I know he's a great guy for you guys. Um, the honorable Farrakhan. If at the end of the day, he is a messiah, let's say he unites the house of Israel, he builds a temple in Jerusalem for all nations of people, and he ends world the wars. Hey, I'm I'm not going to complain. This is going to be a great world. The United House of Israel, a place to prayer in Jerusalem. So all the Jewish people would be on board for whoever does those three things. But those are the three things that are the litmus test for us to use the name of science to throw it out there on someone. Otherwise, it's just very dangerous. And we've seen the dangers of it in the past thousand years when you had false messianic movements who've led many people astray. 
um, Rabbi Harry. Yes. In one breath, you cautioned, even admonished us in terms I'm of so using good. language Jews, dismissing representation of Jew, Judaism as their own representation. And then you followed that up, presuming to tell us what the authoritative position of Judaism is on the question of the Messiah. Yes, that's you, correct. You delegitimate. It's codified in Jewish law. Well, yes, it's codified in your oral law. But with due respect, in the history, I'm an historian, Rabbi Harry. Sure. A historian of religion. And I think you would know, as I know, that there are different Jewish understandings and expectations of Messiah. You did not quote for us the authoritative position, Jewish position I did. on the Messiah. You only quoted for us the position that you and your set. No, that's not correct. I quoted right. my mon I quoted Maimonides. My Maimonides is... is not, even though later rabbinic Judaism codified him as the authority, but Maimonides is not respected as the authority for all branches of Judaism. That's theological tyranny to say that the position and the sect, the rabbinic Talmudic sect that you subscribe to. What other sects are there out there? Yeah. So, Rabbi Mordecai, I hate this is the only sect Rabbi of the Jewish Mordecai people. Hager. Rabbi Mordecai Hager is authentically Jewish, the one who acknowledged the honorable brother minister Farrakhan as Messiah, his Jewish credentials are no less than your Jewish credentials, Rabbi Harry. Jews for Jesus, Messianic Jews. You may disagree with them because you personally subscribe to a different sect of Judaism. No, there is no 2000 tradition of Messianic Jewry though. There's I'm no sorry. Thing as, there is no, there is no two thousand year messianic Jewry. That's it could be a recent one hundred year old movement, a fifty year old movement. Uh, there is no line of sages uh, that is yeah. opposing. But before, that, but there was a time. Not even one. No yeah, there was a time when there was no rabbis. So rabbinic Judaism at one point was a newfangled thing. Rabbinic Judaism over time won. The great battle in terms of political power in the world, but that doesn't make rabbinic Judaism right. Rabbinic Judaism was as much an innovation at some point than any other articulation of Judaism is. But the point is, you are only sharing with us, Rabbi Harry, what you and those who are subscribe to what you subscribe to how you understand it now well, what, what i'm saying is there is no other real group of jews that spans a 2000 year old history maybe besides the Karaites, but they number a few thousand people in the world today yeah no but you know that to i think to not be true we just looked at the ethiopian jews who have a long history and their Judaism goes back, is closer to a, an older articulation of Judaism than yours is. So to say that there is no other 2,000 year old. Well, Judaism, it's not about who is it. older here. But Let's you say, can uh, quote that, Rabbi Harry. No, it has nothing to do with, with who's got an older tradition because we see if, you know, if, if so, let's say someone says, 
I'm going to recreate the incense of the temple and I'm going to do on the Day of Atonement. I'm going to create an offering with the goat. Everything that the high priest of Israel did, just because he's doing something that was practiced older, does that make what he's doing what what what, what should be doing today for the Jewish right. people? So no, the logic of saying what's, no, who's doing something older. And because you subscribe to rabbinism, that doesn't make it authoritative. Well, for anybody except for you and those who subscribe to that thought. But I want to, if I may, because who is Messiah? I do not accept the definition that the rabbis define or offered for Messiah, I do not accept that. I know historically that there were descriptions of the coming Messiah's plural far beyond what the rabbis offer, how they delimit. Well, we definitely believe in a two what, messianic system, so that's for sure. Say that again. We definitely believe in the two messiahs, one from the right. house of David, right. one from the house of Joseph. And I am suggesting that the fulfillers of the prophecy of Genesis is the black man and woman here in America, the only ones who fit. I may be down with that. That may be cool with me, but it doesn't have anything to do with the messiah. Well, but I am saying that. That's a stretch to me. Right. But I am saying that the fulfillers of that prophecy that, that could were be promised visitation by God. The fillers of that prophecy were promised visitation by God. And I am saying, and we are saying that God, that we are the fulfillers of that prophecy and that God has visited the black man and woman in America and a fruit of that visitation is the honorable, most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable Minister Farrakhan. They are the fruit of the visitation of God to the man and woman in America, a visitation that was promised to the fulfillers of that scripture, of that prophecy. This okay. is what we have. I mean, listen, personally, I'm okay with you believing who you want to believe is Messiah. So I'm not offended by it. I'm not going to try to take that away from you. At the end of the day, I will still call that for my own speculation. Let's say I, let's say I, did, I did agree that there were Israelites taken on these slave ships, which I've gone on record saying it's very likely before. Now let's look at a guy, for example, like, uh, let's say Kendrick Lamar or someone, right? He's saying he's a, he's a black Hebrew Israelite or even Kanye West, for example. So... What you're saying that they, they can't be the Messiah, but because the Messiah is already chosen. But if they're in the pool of candidates, maybe Kendrick Lamar could be the Messiah. No, the Messiah <laughs> is. How do you know he's the Messiah? Messiah? That's what I'm trying to get to. That's How the do fundamentals? you know? How do you know? That's that's the fundamental question. That's the right question how do you know and i and, and i don't really hear you know one or two rabbis gave him a gift that said he was i want no, to know no, 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 how no, do no, i know as no, a human no, being like make me no, sure no rabbi hager did not make the honorable brother mr farrakhan messiah okay. god made the honorable brother mr farrakhan so, so how do we know rabbi hagar just acknowledged that you asked the right question rabbi Hager. okay i'll try, I'll try what to. make the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable Minister Farrakhan Messiah. Now, and is, it, is the, the first one you mentioned is not alive anymore, correct? That is not correct, no. Oh, he's alive? That is not. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad? Yes, sir. Okay, my, my, my apologies. I, just, I thought he lived a long time ago. Not, not necessary. The Quran describes Jesus 
as having been made to appear dead as a consequence of a murder plot. The okay. but the Quran. Is Elijah Muhammad born in eighteen ninety seven? Yes, but the still honor, alive. Oh yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Well, all right. Because the death plot of 1975 missed. It failed. Because, and why did it fail? This is the point. Everything is predicated upon the prophecy of Genesis, Rabbi Harry. But the prophecy is that they would get wealthy after 400 years of slavery. But first, the God will visit. Okay, so and I'm not connecting not the, the dots, though. So. Not the prophecies of Torah and the prophecies of Quran. They agree that that people, you mentioned Deuteronomy, and the people who will be brought in those ships. Deuteronomy also mentions the one like Moses that will be raised up. Which among verse is that? You know uh, we can get it to one like Moses. Yeah. And either, the, either way, I'll, I'll take your word for it. I'd like to see the verses, but I'll take your word for it. But still, I'm way, still saying, even like if there Moses. is one like this, how do we know it's this human being? Yeah. And, where, and I'm very curious, where is Elijah Muhammad? Right you, now? Know, you know a tree by the fruit it bears, Rabbi Harry. Every in rabbinic tradition, that seems listen. Well, but I'm gonna restate this point. I don't want to be disrespectful to your Messiah. That's it's a dangerous thing to disrespect someone's Messiah. No, so I just no, say that. no, you're not disrespecting. You okay. disagreeing isn't disrespectful. Okay, but, thank you. Then. Thank oh, you. what is disrespectful? I have to say, is dismissing. What we are saying as mere speculation, but posturing your offering as authoritative non-speculation. Well, I'm not saying I'm not saying what my thing is authoritative over you. What I'm saying is my thing is authoritative over the name Jew. So, like, if you're going to use the name Jewish or Jew or Jew, so that's like where like you could be, you know, you could be another religion or whatever you want. You're not putting my information. You're on you. authoritative over who those Jews whom you represent. But let's get to this point of okay. the qualifications of the Messiah. The, when you celebrate Seder, Passover, the, when you leave an empty cup, for Elijah, when you leave during your Seder observation, your Passover observation that commemorates the exodus out of Egypt, that commemorates the process of redemption from that 400 year slavery. When you celebrate that historic prophetic event, you place a cup for Elijah. You leave the door open for Elijah. You talk of redemption. The people of Israel are redeemed. We've been doing the that for Elijah. thousands of years without missing a year. The Elijah is the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. How do we know that, Rabbi Harry? I mean, you're saying something a thousand years ago was talking about someone born in 18 something, something? Yes, that's it. I'm absolutely. And the Elijah from the Bible who went up in a chariot of flames is the same guy? That is correct. How because do we, how do we know? Between, there's a difference between history and prophecy. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us and the historical record buttresses gives every warrant for what he said. He teaches us that only 25% of what's written in the Holy Scripture is historic. 75% of it is prophetic. Man writes history, Rabbi Harry, he after said that? it occurs. God writes history before it occurs. And that's scripture. 
So most scripture is prophecy. It's not a record of what has already transpired. It's Who a record that? of what will transpire by the will of God. And so, well, yes. I'm trying to figure out who said that. Like, whose teaching is that? I'm most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And who taught him that? God. Okay, I just want to come to a, a, a clear conclusion here. God. Again, that a very serious, a, a very serious a prophecy okay. of God's promise to visit the people. That's the choice. God, when you identify the people who fits that prophecy, then the promise is God will visit that people. Okay. And so God will raise up, will bring about redemption for that people. And the honorable Elijah Muhammad, his work with this people, Rabbi Harry, is a work of redemption. It's the honorable Elijah Muhammad. And that's why I go back to the opening of this discussion. The very theology, the very ideas of God, the very unique and peculiar ideas of God that's at the heart of Jewish esoterica. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad explicitly taught it to black people. And with that teaching about God that Jewish esoterica acknowledges, he transformed black life in America. That's redemption. The Honorable Brother Minister Farrakhan is a redeemer among black people, among the people who fulfills that prophecy. Well, yeah, time out, time out. Yeah. I love I love being calling these people redeemers in the sense that they're helping their people. There's nothing more beautiful in the entire world than a human going and helping his people. And from that you know, what I have heard about Mr. Farrakhan is he's a tremendous saint in that regard of helping his people. And that is such a warm thing to hear that there's people doing that. Where I where I get an alarm go off is for you to say that this is how the Torah is in the ratio of, of history versus prophecy. And I know this because there was one human who had a prophecy. So it sounds like there's a whole movement in a religion that stands on one person's interpretation of something. When I speak from my perspective, I'm standing on the shoulder of thousands or not ten, tens of thousands of sages and scholars who work together to get where I am today in a system that was organized and made sense and was logical and not, not, not based on the metaphysics. So now it's so because and this is the same thing with, uh, with, with, you know, the Quran and Muhammad is that both you uh, your 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 group and, and Islam in general, Muhammad, they agreed that God revealed himself to the Israelites in, in the desert. 600,000 men had a revelation where they saw God and he gave them the Torah. But then that was all fun and games until one man, which would be uh, Muhammad, the prophet, or they call the prophet, one man had a vision from God and said, no, no, it's all different, it all changed. Here's, here's how it's going to go going forward. And so that for me is dangerous, especially in like the 1900s or 1800s or wherever it is, for someone to say, I had a revelation and now I am going to tell you what, what is the word of God. For me, that's where just like, hey, I, I don't mess with that type of stuff. It seems like speculation. Except you're it's a rabbi, so you do mess with that. You no, just, we don't. We, we, we simply are, just try to ha figure, like, like a lawyer. Rabbi is like a lawyer. How to apply the Constitution, how to apply the laws of the Torah. That's all we're trying to do. We can't uproot the Torah. We can't uproot principles, but we can figure out how to apply it. And we can't do that on our own hunch or whim. Any rabbi who says a law has to give you the source of his law, how he got to that conclusion, like a lawyer would. Like a lawyer has to cite cases. The whole Talmud is made up of legal cases. It has to be case-based. It's a very rational, non-metaphysical, non-speculative system. But at the end of the day, because I really do think we can go in circles on this, I'm totally fine with anyone having their own theological beliefs of who the Messiah is and not, but I don't think that should get in the way of get us figuring out why there's so much evil in the world and what we're going to do to combat it. Right, that's fine, but I want to leave this point on this note. Okay, okay. If these aren't you and I, Rabbi Harry, we aren't two secularists having a secular conversation. Right. You We're stepping into are, a theological ring. You are 
by dint of being a rabbi, you are a theologian. Correct. By dint of being a student minister in the nation of Islam, I am a theologian. You and me are having a theological conversation. Now, you have your theological understandings and you are representing on this show the position of the people who you represent. In this case, the rabbinic circles that you represent. I am representing the nation of Islam and the theological tradition of the nation of Islam. So these are two theological traditions that are engaging each other. Would you agree with that? I do agree, but I also believe that theological conversations are sometimes a little silly uh, when we have to take a look at saying there may be more important conversations to be having. That that's fine. I'm not arguing that, but but okay. I want but to, yeah, for the sake, for, yeah, if we're, oh, you're totally oh, right. We're we're discussing why theological important. elements. Why that's yeah. important? That should humble you and me. Yeah. These are two theological traditions. What you are presenting, Rabbi Harry, is a theological position, the theological speculation that you represent. Correct. So, we both have two I'm different glad, stories I'm that we glad, believe is right. I'm glad you admit that. That's a hey. very important milestone that you are admitting that what you are representing is nothing more and nothing less than the theological position, the theological speculation of the sect that you agree with or subscribe to. That's why I do society. think it's a little silly because we're all just speculating of what we think right. is happening. But you had a hard time admitting that until now. No, what I won't what I won't do is for someone to speak on behalf of what I believe in. And that's what happens very often with these conversations. When someone says the Jews this, the Jews that, that I say, whoa, whoa, that's a fringe group of humans. The Jews is, a, is an ancient system of 2000 plus years. And there's only one of those alive. And there's no there's no second one that rivals it. And that, that I'm going to stay strong to, even though that whole thing could be something that we're speculating is really happening on planet Earth. But that's just our position. So like, to speak about the Jews. Closing out the conversation on the Messiah, yeah. given that these are two theological perspectives, your perspective, sure. it's our perspective. We've got our own stories we're telling if ourselves. We, but, 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 we can look at scripture, we can look at certain empirical data, and we can have a legitimate conversation about who the Messiah is. You said, well, it's good to hear black people helping black people. That's not what we're talking about here. What the most honorable Elijah Muhammad is doing, what the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is doing with this human population in America, this very peculiar human population in America. That's not the NAACP helping black people. What these two men with the backing of God who visited this land, what these two men did to this human population, Rabbi Harry, what the American Holocaust of slavery which many Jews were significantly involved in, what the American Holocaust of slavery did to this people and produced in this people, the black man and woman in America, no human population has ever encountered the consequences, the physiological, the psychological, the spiritual consequences of suffering 400 years of American slavery. They call it the peculiar institution and it produced a peculiar people. So redemption, we're not talking, 
talking about this. Well, I'm, I'm with you on all this so far. So, all that no, makes a lot of sense. Follow me. So I'm gonna close this thought, but follow me. But then, so, then the Messiah stuff, that's where I get thrown off. Well, well, no. So it's critical to the Messiah stuff because redemption, we're talking about not just Kanye West or NAACP or Urban Lee helping black people. We're talking about redemption and what does redemption look like? What the honorable Elijah would you, Muhammad. Would you say that the African-American in America now has reached the state of redemption? We are in a process of redemption, absolutely. And it is the transformation of human life. That's what you have to look at. So it Barry. is Mr. F uh, Minister Farrakhan, he's the exclusive res one responsible for the process of the African-American getting a better situation? Again, I'm not, better situation is not my lane. Or redemptive situation. Redemption, okay. the transformation is very important. He's the exclusive Word person time. amongst you guys that is every leading black, towards this better situation. Right. Every black organization has contributed something positively to black people being in a better situation. That's not what we're talking about redemption the transformation of black life taking the state of black humanity as it existed in 1930 and transforming it into what the most honorable elijah muhammad successfully produced in the quality of black life what the honorable brother minister farrakhan is producing in the quality of black life that's redemption that's what we are talking about the measure of redemption isn't just are you in a better situation on tuesday okay, yeah those are nuanced words monday I and so i would invite you to examine the transformation the life transformation of those who came to the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable Minister Lord Farrakhan, you will see that a human population was put in a most horrendous state of affairs. And the honorable Elijah Muhammad took that population, those who followed him, those who acknowledged him, they experienced a transformation unparalleled in America or any place else in the world. That's redemption. Redemption is human transformation. Okay, I mean, that's great, but so we believe there's gonna be one man that's gonna transform the whole world. So until that happens, it's yes. just, it's like a race. May the best man win. Like, how do we know who's gonna get there first? Well, no, but the proof is in the pudding. You, you. Well, the pudding is when the whole world is in that state. No. And that goes back right. to the but Jewish the war. Lore. Start, but the work started with the black man and woman in America, and we are offered as evidence that God has come. See, now, Rabbi Harry, if you see transformation, human transformation, but it's it happens to occur among black people in America, the population that the whole world despises, when you see that human transformation start among us, don't dismiss it because maybe you rather it has started in Israel. It didn't. It no, started I wouldn't dismiss Europe. it. I think, I think it's a, a crucial thing. I have tons of ideas so of how, to, how you guys evidence. So then I am suggesting that we are submitting that work of human transformation that began here in America. It's going to go global. But what we're saying is this beginning stages is evidence that God has visited, not Jerusalem, God has visited America and the people he is doing his redemptive work among are not asking Nazi Jews, they're black Americans. That's what we are saying.
Well, time out. First of all, there's verses that will say that God's going to bring his people back to Jerusalem on his holy mountain. And, and you know, there are obviously things involved in uh, the prophecy there. But the, what, I, what, I, what I think is likely happening is, uh, in Jerusalem. We may very well end up there, but we don't start there. God doesn't well, start what, what seems is happening to me is that there's lots of groups scattered around the whole world that have uh, remnants from the children or the people of Israel, including the Igbo and potentially including the ones who came to America on the transatlantic slave trade. And I think as a nation, we're going to try to seek to have a redemptive pattern for all of us, all humans. So I think to say that all that like you're what you're basically saying is that all redemptive things that are going to happen in the future of humanity lies on the shoulders of one man and 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 no one else scripture i'm i'm sorry because you and i are not secular no you're i'm saying you're saying a specific man you're saying the name of the man that it's resting on because god always raises up one man rabbi harry you know that the prophetic line is god raises up a man and gives his message to reveals his will to so as scriptural people, you and I. So who was the man in the 1700s? I'm sorry? Was there was there a man in every generation? Or does it skip a thousand years sometimes? Well, I have not done that critical study. I don't know. But what I do know is that the man, right? However many men. It basically God comes down to is your man the man or is someone else the man? And that's just going to be, we're not going to know until the whole story is over. No. But but what I'm saying is, no, I'm saying is on the table, there's enough evidence for rational people to consider, to look at. And I am saying that the work done by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Farrakhan, the work done among a peculiar people, the people who happen to fulfill the prophecy of Genesis. So we know this is the people. We know that that work of redemption is going to be here. And I'm saying that there is enough rational people to consider that indicates that the work of redemption is done by these two men, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable Minister Lewis Park. Okay, so I guess where we're going to come to on this on this topic is I do think that the African American is a peculiar people. You do look at the culture in America and the influence that they've had on on music and 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 speech and everything is uh you know because I went to public school as a kid so I I saw you know my my first CD I listened to was Notorious B.I.G. Life After Death and O.D.B. and this was and then I wore my Shaq jersey to school. And then, you know, I saw that I noticed only looking back, like, okay, the African-American set the cultural bar and standards for America. They're clearly a special people, uh, beautiful people, you know, with the music and the jazz and the spark and the soul. There's something there that other people don't have around the world. And, and they've affected global, the culture of the global world, which is a beautiful thing. So for me, it wouldn't be such a crazy stretch or far-fetched thing for, um, you know, a, a, a Judean or, or someone from this community to either you know convert or to be a to be to keep the laws of the people of Israel and to rise up and be a, a redemptive messianic figure. That even that could work with me to a degree. I could mess with that. But to start to say that it's this human X Y Z and then you got to follow his man made rules and interpretation of the thing. That's where I'm like, okay, that's where I draw the last line. So I think I'm with you like a lot of the way, which is great validation. We're on the same page. It's a good message to spread. But then, I, then I'm still, and, and it, does, it doesn't mean anything that this is my position. What does it mean for you guys? It shouldn't mean anything, but I'm just stating my position is once we start putting names out there as this is the person, I start to say, whoa, this can get real dangerous real quick. But if, but if we are not secular lists, you and I, we come to this conversation believing in God. You and I believe in God and you and I believe in the God of the Torah and you and I believe in the prophecies of the Torah. And so since you and I agree on that, then we should, neither one of us should be adverse to the idea that there is a specific man that will be identified as Messiah. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. 
but it, what it never makes no sense. sense. No, that makes total sense to me that there will be a man. But oh. alongside of that, how how much that makes sense to me it makes just as much sense that we shouldn't decide who that is until he does the job. But he's but what I'm see, Let him do it. I'm lost. I am yeah. saying that the evidence is clear that the job is being done. It seems to me that your hang up. Rabbi Harry, no, because you got it's not good. America's not good right now. It's pretty crazy. I don't see any any real signs of like you know. It could be from the darkest moments comes the light. I'm down with that because the president needs to listen to God's man. That's the point. I don't if know, the president of the United States listen to and accept the divine guidance of the man that God raised. That's from. very risky. America, That's very risky. But theology is risky, Rabbi. Harris. Yeah, but a president running a country can't just take one man's word for it that God visited him. However, but the scriptures that you and I both That's believe very dangerous. in. But the scriptures that you and I both believe in has God raising up Moses and sending him to the government of Egypt. And sure. I am saying, we are saying that that and Moses was successful. So right. if Farrakhan or Moses whatever is successful, and, then we know. Okay, right. And because Muslim. that never happened in history, Rabbi Harry, that never happened in history, that was prophecy. So the Moses that will go to Pharaoh, the governor, well, that Moses. You're saying that's Islam. Elijah Muhammad's that understanding. That's exactly what we are saying because that never happened yeah. in history. According to Elijah Muhammad. No, according to history. Well, we according can, to Elijah Muhammad, that never happened, right? Because no, no. you're saying he was saying it's not a historical book, it's a prophetic no, book. No, 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 sir. No, I'm saying I'm saying something different now. Let me real clear. According to all historical data, that never happened in Egypt 4,000 years ago. There was never a time when there was a 400 year sojourn of Jews in Egypt. Well, we actually teach that, it was 210, 210 years. But the 210 would only align with not Jewish suffering in Egypt, but Jewish i.e. Pixos rulership and abuse in Egypt. So the story of the great exodus never happened in history. We got, when we can cite all of the historical data, it's a fact. Now, because it didn't happen in history as an actual fact, that doesn't mean it is to be dismissed. It means that you should look for where that was fulfilled. And it was fulfilled in the black man and woman in America. Well, you're saying it wasn't fulfilled yet because Moses, well, I'm not even saying I agree with you, but Moses infiltrated the palace and did whatever he had to do. You're saying Donald Trump should give, give let Farrakhan be the Moses, but he didn't do it yet. If Donald President Trump is wise if President Trump So we didn't get the full Moses country. situation yet. We're if still we, waiting for that prophecy according to We you. we are in the midst of divine drama playing out before our yeah. eyes, Rabbi Harry. It seems like we'll know the answer pretty soon then. But 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 we can look at what has already transpired and right. reach a rational opinion if we are predisposed to disbelieve. Now, it sounds like if what we describe was taking place in a Jewish community here in America, I doubt you would be as incredulous as you are now. But because this is playing out among a people whom the world despises, there's a lot of incredulity, even though there's so much that aligns, that lines up with the scripture. So, I didn't see that much line up with 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 how I to know see. he's the Messiah, but I see a lot lining up with potential transatlantic slave trade stuff, but not about who the Messiah is as an individual. But, but right. it, 
it's right. But if you if we agree that because I don't even see I don't even see proof that the Messiah would come from this group of people who went on the transatlantic slave ship in the text. I see God visits them. He re, he helps redeem them. He helps build them up. He makes them great wealth. All those things. But I don't see anywhere it says in the scriptures that from this specific group of people come the Messiah, Mashiach, the Messiah. Yeah. And so when you remember when Herod killed the boy babies looking for the Messiah? Who? Oh, Herod. Herod. Mm -hmm. King Herod. I recall Herod. that story. And J. Edgar Hoover destroyed every black organization looking for the messiah i don't need i didn't that that i've never heard before oh yes that's the fact the j edgar hoover in his or through his counterintelligence program targeted for destruction and destabilization every black organization in america he was on the hunt by his own confession in the cointel pro documents he was on the hunt for the Messiah. He destabilized black groups and organizations because he knew Messiah was coming up out of these people. Jaeger <laughs> Hoover is Herod in a fundamental way. So if the if you can agree that the transatlantic slave trade that those ships identify the black man and woman in America as the people who would be carted off. And if you will agree, and you will have to if you are not prejudiced against truth, that no people has been in bondage. And by your own admission, you said 210 years, but the scripture the prophecy says that people will be in bondage for 400 years. No people fits that description in a strange land that isn't their own. No people fits that description, but the black man and woman in America. So if you can see that point and you can see that we have from West, the population in West Africa, that was snatched that we have lineage from ancient Israel, then you will bear witness that the, the work of redemption, that Exodus, that Exodus will be, will come to and from this people in America. Well, if there's an Exodus, Rabbi Harry, then there's a Moses. If there's an Exodus, Rabbi Harry, there's an Aaron. There well, is unlike no the story Exodus of Egypt, the nation. And Aaron. Unlike the story of Egypt, the nation in Egypt, the nation was together and they left together as one nation with their leader. But when you look and at that's the scriptures, here. well, when you look at the scriptures, it speaks about the children of Israel coming from the west, from the north, from the east, from from this part of Africa, from this part of China, from the northern islands. So, so you know what I'm, you know, this is a, it doesn't seem to sync up with me what you're saying. Well, but none of that is part of the prophecy of Genesis. The but, people, so the, what I'm saying is the prophecy of Genesis doesn't really say anything about this will be the Messiah comes from here. But, but, but follow me, but follow me. It just says that there's going to be a slavery and you're going to, you know, then God will but come and judge it, and save but you. But what it does say is there's a Moses and there's an Aaron. There is no 400 years without Exodus, there is no 400 years without God raising up Moses and making Moses a God among the people to Pharaoh. That's what the scripture says. So if you can see, if you can walk with us, that the black men and women in America are the fulfillers of that prophecy, then that ipso facto means that there's a Pharaoh that God rose up and put his words in his mouth and made him a God to Pharaoh. And that that Moses has his heir apparent, Aaron. And we are saying that that is the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. 
and the Honorable Minister Farrakhan, it all fits, Rabbi Harry. If we are not predisposed to disbelief, it all fits. I, I don't see how it all fits. It still seems like the last straw of speculation on who the guy is going to be. Um, we we could definitely, you know, I, I'm I'm optimistic about it. Um, that it sh that will be a Messiah that will come and redeem us all. And I'm whoever it is, I'll be very supportive of him, as will the Jewish people of the whole entire he's world. Black, Rabbi Harris. I wouldn't have a problem with a black Messiah in the slightest. I thought, well, you know, I think a good well, candidate would be. You look like a guy like Amari Stoudemire, studying Torah Messiah. law. He could be a good Messiah. Who? Uh, I would say a guy like Amari Stoudemire. You know, he's studying Torah. He's righteous now. He he looked like a good messianic candidate. Two. He's your student, Rabbi Harry. So you are saying that the only legitimate candidate for a black Messiah that you will accept is well, a I person. Well, I personally believe that the Messiah. Arrogant, Rabbi. Well, no, it's not arrogant. It's my theological belief that the Messiah will come from the Jewish people. So. You know, that's just my belief. I'm not saying you're arrogant by thinking and, and, and it, happens, it happens to be the one black man who's your student, your personal student. I was throwing who, out an you example. You are teaching him Judaism. Well, no, first of all, he's, he's, not, he's not my student. He's got a lot of people in his now, life. But... Friend, that's my brother. I love him. I got yeah. great respect for right. him. I was just using that as an example of me supporting a... a, a... What? That was an example I've thrown out there. Okay. It, could, it could, like I say, it would be if Kendrick Lamar became a Jewish guy, I'd be like, oh, Kendrick could be a Messiah for sure. The Messiah is not an entertainer. The Messiah is not a ball player. The Messiah is the source of divine guidance to the nation. Well, well someone the could have been a ball Minnesota player, and then he's gonna, time. then he's gonna change his ways. So we judge. Just like you were saying, what's going to be the process in the future? It could be Kendrick Lamar becomes a spiritual leader for the people. Who knows? Oh, absolutely. Shout out he, to Brother Kendrick Lamar. I think right now he is a spiritual leader for the people. That's he's for sure. Using, he's using his medium to give insight to black people. I believe Amari Stoudemire is a spiritual leader for black people, but we're not talking about spiritual leader leaders we're talking about the one ones whom god himself raised up to be the source of divine guidance for his people and for the nation that has oppressed his people for 400 years and i am saying that divine guidance has come to black people not from kendrick lamar though i love him Divine guidance has come to black people, not from Kanye West, though I love him. Divine guidance has been coming to black people since the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has been transforming black life. And today, divine guidance, not just to black people, but to America. Divine guidance has been coming to this country from the Honorable Brother Minister Farrakhan, if you will listen to him, you will hear divine guidance. You won't hear vanity. You won't hear sport and play. You hear divine guidance to a country that is unraveling. That's how you, that's what you should be looking for. If you are looking for Messiah among the people, you don't go to the sports arena looking for the Messiah. You don't judge the Messiah based on how many points, how many baskets he could make. You judge Messiah. You judge Well, God's you're judging based on what you speculate is going to happen in the future. You're saying this guy is going to bring world peace, X, Y, Z. He's going to be the one to do it. So don't put a guy... Like what you're no. doing right now is you're essentially no. saying all the kids playing basketball or rappers are saying you can't be a spiritual leader for people. You can't change. No, you can't grow. Rabbi I, Harry, you're I said excluding... those persons are spiritual leaders. I said those persons so how are. Come they can't, yeah. How come they can't level up and become a messiah? You Why is that already boxed? They absolutely can. So we are taught by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad that when the scripture says God says, I will send saviors, plural, after them. That every black man and woman has the potential to be savior. Absolutely. 
every black man and woman. In fact, that's what redemption looks like. And right, when a well, black man goes from being a black man and woman, goes from being persons of simple sport and play to be spiritual saviors for their people, that's part of the redemptive process. And yes, every single black man and woman in America has that as a call of duty, in fact. What I'm saying is that I'm not saying that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Farrakhan, that their credentials are based on future events. I'm saying that their record now is evidence of who they are. Their record right now is evidence that they are the ones who have been the engine, engines of human transformation, i.e. redemption, among black people in America. It's their record of what they did do, not speculation about what they may do in the future. Their record certifies well, if, them as the redeemers of black people by Allah's grace, because Allah, God visited this nation and rose up Moses and rose up Aaron. Well, it seems like we could go on for quite a while with this particular conversation. And I just want to say that um, if you're just now tuning in, we've been discussing God, who the Messiah is. We have Rabbi Harry Rosenberg joining us today uh, with Dr. Wesley, and it's been very theological. For all of our awesome, powerful creators who feel like the conversation should have hurry up and moved on. Please be patient. This conversation is much bigger than just me and deciding when we should move forward. And for anyone that is, you know, I've I've been reading all the comments. You know, don't don't feel sorry if you think I'm confused. If if, if you're focused on whether or not I am confused, you are missing the point. Again, this conversation is not about one individual person. This is a historic conversation that's never happened before, and we should, you know, be honored that two individuals are devoting so much time to us right now to educate us and to go through their different theological perspectives versus rushing for an in conclusion, right? So I just want to say that and thank you all for tuning in. We have a lot of viewers right now. With that being said, another thing that we have decided to talk about today is anti-Semitism as well as anti-Blackness. And it's quite interesting that, you know, this week is Black Jewish unity and based off of what the Jewish community has decided along, along with the National Urban League, it's about combating anti-Semitism as well as racism. Not anti-Blackness though, which I thought was, was interesting, but racism broadly. And that reminds me what really uh, initiated my, me asking you, Rabbi, to have this conversation is because I was really confused about what happened with Nick Cannon and really what was anti-Semitism. And I think before we can understand what is anti-Semitism, I'd like for you to first explain what is a Semite or what is a Jew. Oh, okay, so it's a great, great thing. And first of all, I think it was ridiculous what happened to Nick Cannon. And I think the rabbi um, he brought on is very intelligent, but they really didn't touch the touch on the issues of why Nick really shouldn't have been in trouble. Um, first of all, when we say the word anti-Semite, you know, then I, I, I listen to the conversation. So then the African-American will be like, you're not a Semitic people to call us anti-Semitic. We're Sem Semitic, so we can't be anti-Semitic because we're Semitic. So, and, and then when they're defining Semitic, they're saying people from a Semitic language or the region, the Semitic region, and it includes these groups of people and they're dark-skinned people, not light-skinned people. But really, here's, here's the serious truth of the whole matter. When we say Semite, we're saying Semite comes from the word shame or uh, the descendant of Noah. A Shemite means someone from the house of shame. So Semitic is someone from shame, from the house of Noah. And we know the children of Israel come from Noah, uh, from shame, from Noah. And basically shame had uh, houses of study. We learn in the Torah literature that Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham all studied in the house of Torah of shame. Israelite culture influence came from shame, from the information of Noah. So in this reality of shame, they had this thing that emerged from it called the Torah that was initially started from the schools of shame. And in that system of the Torah, it didn't say that if you're not part of the bloodline of shame, you can't be in this. They said the opposite. They said, 
all humans, this is open source, all humans can join this. So when we say anti-Semite, we really are meaning against the, the family or the house of shame. Like that verse I read before, if someone converts and becomes part of the house of Israel, he has the name Israel put on him. He has the name Israel put on him. So if someone, let's say, is, is not bloodline from the house of shame, he could still say anti-Semite if the person is trying to use the, his allegiance to the Torah as something negative and something to hate on him for. That would be, so we, we should change the word from anti-Semitic Semitic to be anti-Torah, you know, or anti-people of Israel. Um, instead of anti, it's just a bad word to describe what we're referring to as against the people of Israel. That being said, so I think like against the people of the state of Israel. No, 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 the people of Israel. The state of Israel is a political entity. We could discuss whether or not I'm in favor with uh, the government and their policies. I know for sure um, my ancestors were settling the land of Israel before Z the Zionists got here. So I have a theological and political claim to the land that predates Zionism. So I don't think Zionism in Israel should be looked at as a marriage partner. But I think Israel should be the home for the Torah and the people of Israel, uh, regardless of your color or creed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at the end of the day is so like that was one thing. So like I thought with Nick was like, OK, so the anti-Semitic thing was is, is nothing to do with color or being from which region. It has to do with which doctrine you are part of. And if you are from the Torah, that is essentially they identify as being from the house of shame. But secondly is, you know, getting called out for Zionism stuff. It's a, it's a, it's a tricky topic. And, you know, people know I have a lot to say on it, but it's also a scary topic. But I, I think that there is some truth to say that if, if they think that there's Jews who are Zionistic, who are practicing things that are evil, they shouldn't hide behind the fact that they're Jews to like use that as a shield to not take criticism. Um, so I so I don't I don't appreciate when a Zionist will just throw out the word anti-Semite if there's going to be some truth to certain things that he's got to rectify or is not in sync with the with the Word of God. So in general, Nick Cannon's an all-star guy in my book. I, I have a lot of love for a guy like that. Um, I would even want to talk to him about the lost tribes of Israel and other things to like build and work together. But uh, at the end of the day, it's very dangerous because the when I said you put the word you put the S at the end of Jew, so like there could be some shady bad Jews doing some crazy stuff in the world. But now to say the Jewish people, it's like whoa, that's gonna lead to someone at my door with a pitchfork like burning down my house, and like I'm really trying to avoid that. So please don't talk like that. So that's the sensitivity of the Jewish people because if you know their history, every 50 years or so for the last 2,000 year exile in Europe and in, in the Mediterranean coastal cities. They were pogroms. We were raped and killed. We had the worst life ever there. We couldn't. We couldn't even uh, own land in certain parts of Europe. So we had a we had a horrible experience over there. So for us to now start to see to smell people putting one group or one person's evil actions and grouping it all together, that causes a trauma with the Jews, where they where they go full like anti-Semitism claims, and and then you know then people start getting fired and stuff. So I'd say like the best thing to do is not trigger people or traumatize people by including them in someone else that you're talking about. We have to learn to discern where there's actual evil practices and evil culture and separate that from the Jewish people and the people of Israel who are studying Torah. And for that, you know, I'm down to down to be a political member of the future and fight against uh, certain things that we may find e e evil because I'm on the ground out here. So you may say, Harry, you're a great representative to stand up for certain things. And if I say it, it wouldn't be anti-Semitic because I'm Jewish. That's already backwards in itself, but I'm willing to go in there take one for the team and say what needs to be said, but it can't include the collective Jewish people who the majority of them have nothing to do with this narrative. And if I even told them about certain things about what's going on with, you know, certain uh, principles of Zionism that we may not agree with, it would be news to them. They'd be shocked. So it's not like they're all in, in the debriefed about that. So the honorable brother minister Farrakhan and we who follow him in the nation of Islam, we agree with your premise, Rabbi Harry. The Quran speaks of the people of the book, the Jews, the Christians, the Sabaeans, those who do good, they have their reward with their Lord. So you are correct. No indiscriminate blanket indictment can be made nor has the Honorable 
Minister Farrakhan never made such a an indiscriminate blanket indictment. There are Jews who have a relationship with the Honorable Brother Minister Farrakhan to one degree or another. And it's a good relationship. They are not evil doers, but not but and. I offer this in terms of the discussion of anti-Semitism. Amy Goodman asked Shulamit Alani, the Israeli politician, she said, Amy Goodman, yours is a voice of criticism we don't often hear in the United States. Often when there is dissent expressed in the United States against the policies of the Israeli government, people here are called anti-Semitic. What is your response to that as an Israeli Jew? She answered, well, it's a trick. We always use it. When from Europe, someone criticizes Israel, we bring up the Holocaust. When in this country, in America, people are criticizing Israel, they are called anti-Semitic. The charge of anti-Semitic is a trick. The charge of anti-Semitic is to distract from criticism, even legitimate criticism. The Honorable Minister Farrakhan has never indiscriminately criticized. He has appropriately and legitimately criticized not just evil Jewish behavior, but evil Muslim behavior, evil Christian behavior, but he spends most of his time among black people. His work of redemption, of redeeming black life, requires his criticism of our evil doing. But when he criticizes the evil doing of certain Jewish persons, evil done to black people, the trick is played, the bludgeon is pulled out the trick, the bludgeon of anti-Semitic. And so the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has been socially imprisoned for decades now in this false and malicious charge of anti-Semitism when he speaks a bold truth of correction because as the man of God, that's his prerogative, but even more, that's his duty. As a man of God, he is not a black leader who should just stick with black people. As God's man in this country, he's duty bound to offer guidance to the entirety of the country, not excluding black people, not excluding the president, not excluding the Jewish community. When he offers that corrective criticism, he is labeled anti-Semitic. It's a trick. My brother, Nick Cannon, I and we love him, and he spoke nothing but truth. There was nothing, and if you found Rabbi Harry, any error in our brother Nick Cannon's words, I would love to hear them I am saying that everything Brother Nick Cannon said, we can defend and prove 1,000%. There was nothing that Nick Cannon said that was an error. He was made to apologize for the truth that he spoke, and then he was told his apology wasn't enough. And so... We lost your I don't think we can hear you. So anti-Semitism is a trick in America. Anti-Semitism 
is a way to avoid facing the truth of legitimate and necessary criticism. And in the context of black Jewish relationships, we black people who are part of that black Jewish equation, we have every right to be critical of Jewish behavior vis-a-vis black people. Well, time out. First of all, uh, um, man, my audio cut out because I'm on my phone right now and it's dying and my plug for this and I'll plug it in. But I tried to plug it in, but I still have some percentage left to go. But when Nick Cannon was saying, which I, I liked what he said, and it's different than what he agreed to. He was saying that I think there's a difference between the regular everyday Jew and this quote unquote Zionistic Jew. And he's like, there's something going on with the Zionistic Jews. And but the regular guys are, are 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 fair, you know, fair game. And I would I can give you a two hour lecture to elaborate on that if I had the right platform to do it. It would be dangerous for me, but I could do it. Um, and, but he could say it; he'll get in trouble if I said it. I I would be considered like I had the right to say it because I'm talking about these people who are, or, where I'm from. But time out, which is a little contradictory. But I'm willing to take one for the team, link up with you guys, and then fight because they can't call me an anti semite. But at the end of the day, it seemed that the person Nick was hanging out with started talking about the origin of white men. And this was like, well, my question is like, am I am I a devil, guys? Like, am I, was I made in a lab 6,000 years ago and am I, am I a devil? Are you asking that? I'm asking if that's what you think about me. Right. Well, I don't have any thoughts about you to answer your question. The It is a fact that the Caucasian and I will allow you to self-identify, Rabbi Harry. But it is a fact. What I assume the fella you're referring to that Nick Cannon was hanging out with, I assume you're talking about Professor Griff. Shout out to Professor Griff. He recited accurate history. It is the case, Rabbi Harry, that Caucasian people, their origin in this world is through a process of artificial selection. You know, like Yaku did with the sheet, with Laban sheet, that process of artificial selection is the origin of Caucasian people. And then as much as most asking Nazi Jews, that's why I won't speak of you personally, because I don't know how you self-identify. But in as much as genetically, most asking Nazi Jews on the planet, their genetic history doesn't go back to the Levant. It goes back to Europe, in particular, the Caucasus area. So they are white people. And the, thus, product of the artificial selective mating program that went on 6,000 years ago in or on the island of Patras. And it was, it was, you want to get back to Yaku, we started. God, Yaku. I I read the history and I'm sure everyone listening to you knows your your narrative. I just want to ask a few questions. So it doesn't matter a Jew or not Jew because I'm white, so I was grafted on this island. I'm not a real human and I'm a devil. That's what you guys are thinking. Like, you're you're calling me out for, like, a Talmudic statement of, like, maybe this one black tribe in Africa is this. And then you're like, oh, you guys are mad shady. It's leading to this. But on the other end, like, hey, I'm just a devil. No. Don't put words in my mouth, Rabbi Harry. I never... Well, well I'm trying to suggest, is this what you're seeing? You. No, sir. No. But that's kind of... That, this well, I want to know if I'm a devil no. in your eyes. No. I, I, because I, I'm I from the silent. Devil. My I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't get offended. I'd be okay. Right, with but that. that's not the point. My okay. the honorable Mr. Lewis Farr, kind of man of character, would not allow me, a representative of his, to invite you onto my platform and disrespect you by calling you anything other than how you self-identify. Rabbi well, Harry. That's, that's silly. You either believe white men are the no, devil or not. No, no, but I answered that question. I don't make any proclamations about you because I don't know you beyond your. Forget me. Is the white man the devil? 
Uh, the white man absolutely is. The okay, devil. I'm a I'm a white. Look at if look you at me. Self -identify look at with that, if you self identify no, this is... with that, then it applies. But that's your self. No, you're you're, you're letting me. Okay, you know what? I self identify as an African American. How you feel about that? Oh, you can't do that. Well, no, he said I'm a white man. I'm a white but guy. But it's very you, trendy. I'm, I'm you a white, white guy here. Self identifying <laughs> as African American. So I'm not. If, I, if the white man's a devil I'm and I'm a white man, this is geometry. If two plus x is three, x is one. Yeah, that's fine. You if can. White man is a devil and I'm a white man. I'm the devil. Well, is that what you're saying? So I'm happy to accept. But do you see how that's a little crazy to me that you're calling no, me out no, for like one verse in no. the Talmud, but really I'm the devil? No. no. That's. Like, I'm even calling you out for this. You spent two hours calling me out for that's, this little that's, thing. That's trignology. That's like Rabbi blowing Harry. my mind right now. That's trignology, Rabbi Harry. You cannot say that you came on Brother Wesley Muhammad's platform and he ever called you out. That is not well, my you're voice. a nice guy. You're trying not to hurt my feelings about being a devil. No, absolutely not. I'm not interested in your feelings. Beyond yeah, respect or whatever it is. Beyond respect, but... I am as I am because I'm trying to represent my teacher, the Honorable Minister Lewis Farquhar. If there's a truth to be said, I'm not concerned with whether you will be in your feelings about it, but I'm not of the character because my teacher does not teach me to be of the character that I would have invite you on my show and then disrespect you personally. Okay. You cannot okay. you cannot sell that narrative on the show. You cannot sell that narrative when you leave the show. Okay. I don't know you enough to make any judgment about you personally. Well, After you self-identify, I, <laughs> I will accept if you say brother if you say Dr. Wesley I'm a devil, then I'm gonna say he's a devil. No, no, I'm not saying that. Your, so I'm then, not, so I'm then, saying so then like don't this. try to force me. Don't try to force me to into a petty discourse by saying who you are or who you ain't. That's for you well, to. You, well, you're That's saying white men are devil, and I'm a white man. Am I crazy or people. not crazy? To if say you are it, you know? me about the origin of white people, then let's talk about the origin of white people. No, I'm Leave not talking about. I, I don't want to talk about the origin of white people. What I'm trying to oh, get to. What, well, what I'm trying to get to is this. And first of all, I just want to let you know that I'm coming on this show, and my feelings are okay. I have personal self worth. I'm okay with my own life and my own brain. So I'm not gonna. My feelings aren't gonna get hurt, no matter what any human on planet Earth thinks about me. And the fact that we allow other humans to hurt our feelings is already a level of like insecurity we got to work on as human beings. But secondly, um, my real question is, and I, forget I, it's it's a little too dancy for me. If the white man's a devil and I'm a white man, what are we supposed to do with this white man issue? What's your plan for the white man? Is this gonna lead to like white concentration camps where we got to round up white men? Or so what's the plan for white humans now? If I'm the devil. So the scripture says, okay, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So when God promised in the Genesis prophecy that after the 400 years, he will come and he will judge that nation, that judgment, however that looks, is in the hands of God. That question is way beyond and those considerations <laughs> Are way beyond my pay grade and our pay grade, Rabbi Harry. God, man, the duty God gave to us is to grow and evolve to be like Him. The judgment and the justice that is coming to white people, that in God's hand. Uh -huh. um, oh, oh, oh. I'm just switching between my mic and my charger so my phone doesn't die and then everyone's going to think I'm running away. Um, so first of all, what can you tell me your definition of the devil? Like what does it mean to be a devil? Yeah. Do I not have access to be righteous? Am I locked out? 
I don't know. Only God can answer that about you. See, that's why I'm saying uh, you're 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 I'm in not, touch with I, the Messiah of the world. Yeah, okay. but, you're, but your teacher's you the Messiah. You got to know some some of this stuff. You keep personalizing it, Rabbi Harry. Why? Why as shouldn't I? If a white man's a devil and I'm a white man. How is that not like where where I would be insane to not. not? I don't know. I'm I'm but, a white man. I but, I maybe I think like a black man, but I don't know. But it's not for me to decide. You guys oh, can tell me. But I'm white. Look at my skin. Your personal fate, that's way beyond my pay grade. That's mm. between you and God and the God who came. I have no access to that knowledge, Rabbi Harry. Okay. Well, getting back to anti-Semitism, I will say I, I've noticed that there are differences. Even earlier today when we were talking about the rabbi who uh, blatantly called black people monkeys, right? It was just kind of swept over. And it seems that anytime a black person says perhaps they are the original Jew, is seen as anti-Semitic, or if they criticize and say that there's a secret relationship between blacks and Jews and uh, Jews own Hollywood, that there's a real threat of financial insecurity and job loss. However, if anyone perhaps from who are, um, who are Jewish say anything, it's a misunderstanding kind of like, understanding what the rabbi actually meant when he uh, called black people monkeys. I, I, I always get confused by that and it and I still don't understand then what is anti-Semitism, but I understand the anti-blackness of, of what was what is said. Oh, you, you muted yourself. You hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. I mean, just again, that was a Talmudic tr uh, uh, tractate about when you say a blessing over a black person. Mm -hmm. And the only time you say a blessing on a black person, the Talmud says, is when there's two white parents and give birth to a black child. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, today, that's probably be funny to be like, um, I'm sorry to tell you, dad, that you're probably not the dad. Uh, you know, but uh, this was talking about a case really where there were two white humans who gave birth to a black child. You say a blessing, and it next to that blessing, you say blessings overseeing a monkey, you say uh, overseeing an elephant, and overseeing other wild, rare see, things that you would normally see. So that was like how it all got grouped together. So the rabbi, I don't think, was trying to be racist or anything, but it was poor taste. But I, I just want to go back to like my main question because. I'm not cool with racism, so I'll stand up and call someone out if they say something racist, but I'm just so confused now how you guys could possibly make this a point of contention when the whole entire basis of your messianic movement relies around the fact that white people are devils. So it's like, that is just so contradictory to me on principle of like, I, I'm not even saying I want to have something in my Talmud bad about black people. I don't think there is, and I wouldn't, and that's not my vibe, but... There's like a little smell of it, like a little hint of it. And you guys are making a very big deal about it. But at the same time, you're calling all white people devils. That is the most hypocritical thing in the entire universe to me. Well, let me say this. You asked a good question. I want to answer that. What is a devil? That's the right question. I want to answer that. But okay, also, I'm going to charge my phone while you answer, then I'll plug it back in. And I also want you to understand the context of my brain. Of Rabbi Yosef's comment about blacks and monkeys. I did not offer that to say, look, these people are bad. Remember, I wanted to engage you on the question of theological racial justice. And we're talking about, on the one hand, there's this very widespread, though esoteric, Jewish tradition of divine black skin kept to Jews. Well, on the other hand, there's a tradition of black skin as a curse. And I raised that in the context of the discussion of theological racial justice. I brought in Rabbi Yosef's statement because 
it seems from you that you were trying to pigeonhole and isolate the Babylonian Talmud's authorship of that malicious and fraudulent Curse of Ham narrative. It sounded like you were trying to minimize that. So I brought this other case in just as an illustration. An illustration, not necessarily to say Rabbi Yosef was racist. That was the point I raised. The point I raised was his response to all the controversy was, I just read it in a book. Now, what is the devil? That's important. A devil is any lie germ grafted from origin. Any live germ grafted from original. So the process of graftation makes devil also. Devil is known by its actions. The actions of devil are not just wicked by human standards, but the actions of, of the devil are opposite those of God. So you can tell the devil where where God says don't do, Satan says do. So the devil, shouldn't, says, do, devil shouldn't have anything to really do. To. Sorry, Beth. So devil shouldn't have anything to do with you're grafted or not. It should just be your actions, really. So a black person could be a devil and a white person could be a devil. Well, yes. Okay, yeah. and a white person could be well, right, not a devil. The second, the second part of your question is yes. Black people in America absolutely were made devil. We were born in the sin. What intensity. about? Let, let what me about finish. A, okay. Right, let let me finish. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. We were born in the sin and shaped in the iniquity of American white supremacy. We are the product before God's visitation. That's why this process of redemption is important to see it for what it is before God's coming. We were a people that were made absolutely double. We were made in the image and likeness of the American white supremacist. So we absolutely were devil yeah. in our action. What about, let's say, a warlord in Africa who's chopping the fingers off of little kids if they don't get enough harvest uh, on a certain day and he's just raping people and doing the worst things? He's evil, but not a devil, you would say, because he wasn't in America being influenced by white people. And so, so no. is that what you're saying? No, that's not what I'm, well, I'm That's what I'm asking if that's what you're saying. I'm not trying to say no. that's what you are saying. No. I'm trying to get to the bottom of what you believe no. in, because it seems to you're saying the only black people who could be devils are the ones who were in America who were around white people who were devils. No. Okay, so a black person you anywhere on planet you, Earth you, could become you, a devil. You asked me about black people. I assume you were talking about. No, black I'm talking about can a can so African I an Africa be a devil? I gave you an understanding of the condition of black people in America. Forget America. America. Let's talk about Africa. Devils. So let's be real clear. Anything grafted from origin is devil. Now, all across it's Africa, funny because OG Kush is you know considered the better stream, but it was a great you know they did a lot of grafting to get there. I did. I didn't get that. No, I was just kidding. Marijuana. I was saying like OG Kush is like in the rap songs. It's like the best thing. You know, all the rappers love it, but that no, that's the original. Weed. That's grafted weed. That is double. That's a double plant. All right. All right. I, I'm not, I'm not, I was just kidding only, about that. I was just kidding about that. Holy herb, cannabis, yeah. and then the grafted yeah. plant, that's a double weed. That's a great illustration because that same process plays out in human beings. Grafted from original it's double. So now, your question about Africa, <laughs> all over Africa, you ha you have a continent suffering from post-colonialism, Rabbi Harry. So much of what is African today is the product of European colonialism, mentally, spiritually, economically, socially. So there's a lot of black face grafted on the continent of Africa, absolutely. The aping of the ways of our oppressor. We in America have been made devil because we ate the ways of the American white man. We ate the wicked ways of our oppressor. 
over in Africa. Many of our people are aping the ways of our former colonial masters. And so, so you're there's saying there was and there's never, a never humanity going on over there because over in Africa, they are the students of the inhumanity of the European that was visited upon them. Are you trying to say there was never black on black, you know, war crimes in Africa prior to white men influencing them? I'm not saying that. No, I'm not a romanticist. I don't okay. romanticize about black Africa. I don't romanticize about black America. But I am saying this. What the process that gave birth to the Caucasian people birthing the Caucasian on this earth did not bring evil on the earth. It intensified evil on the earth. Grafting white out of black did not introduce black people to evil because the evil that is incarnate in the grafted man, that evil was already in us. What the presence of white people on this planet does, Rabbi Harry, it didn't introduce wickedness on the planet. It made wickedness the order of the day on the planet. It made evil the paradigm, the world paradigm. We did evil before the coming of the grafting of white people, but evil was never our paradigm. This world is based on a paradigm of evil because why is this world the world of devil? Because the paradigm of this world is whatever God says don't do, you can do. Whatever God says do, this world says, nah, you don't have to do. So that's the distinctive quality of the planet under the rule of white people for the last 6,000 years. They did not introduce evil to the world, but white people made evil the rule of the world. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, hmm, well, I feel like I'm noticing a, a pattern uh and uh i've i've noticed this pattern also on like older interviews i've seen the minister louis Farrakhan be interviewed by uh the don Hillway show barbara walters uh even when we think of today with like carl tuckerson or tucker carlson i mean um even sometimes candace owens as well that when there's discussion specifically around black anti anti-blackness the conversation always seems to shift to either one of black responsibility of uh, black individuals killing each other or perceptions of white people being inherently bad. And then it goes away from the root of anti-blackness and addressing that. And I could be totally wrong of that's what's occurring right now, but it almost seems like we are now morphed into a conversation on whether or not the uh, white man is the devil and it has been grafted versus anti-blackness and anti-semitism but very, again if I'm very, wrong, please correct very me great point very great point oh you're, you're muted rabbi Harry. i sorry about that i just think it's so crazy to really make these points of contention you're making which are valid about racism and all this stuff but yet your your whole doctrine is about a race being superior to another one. So I'm not racist, personally. I love all humans. But if someone told me that they think one color is righteous and one color is a devil, I'd say, well, it seems like you're the racist. So I'm not here calling you guys a racist. But it <clears throat> would seem like, based on paper, what I believe personally as Harry and what you believe personally as Dr. Muhammad, it would seem you would be the one who takes color and race into consideration of who's superior to the other one. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I shall. I'm pulling something up. Hold on. Because this, and it just hit me now. This is the craziest thing in the world to me that this is happening right in front of everyone's face. It's like you're pointing your finger, and maybe you learned it from us. Maybe white people were so racist that taught you to call us the devils. Like it could be this is some psychological messed up situation, but I was born. Uh, in the 80s, in a generation that didn't, you know, I went to public school, Chinese friends, Indian friends, black, 
I don't see colors. I just see humans and I give charity to humans across the spectrum and I love humans across the spectrum. There's not an ounce of hate in my heart. But it seems like I'm talking to a group of people who is certain that the white man is the devil. So this for me is a is a new point of understanding of if we're going to have like a woke meeting at the table where everyone's like get to the table, it's like the new woke generation of people ready for love, freedom. How could there be a seat at the table when one of your preconceived notions is I'm a devil? Right. Right. So, Rabbi Harry. And for me, that's like the peak of this whole conversation that I, that like, this is where I'm at. And this has to be addressed now, but. Right. And so let's say. I wouldn't even care if I'm the devil because I'm like, you know, that would be fine. But it still would be like, don't call me racist or don't call. But so let's address it. I sense from you, if I can be candid, Rabbi Harry. Anything. I sense an ins- insistence on your part to feign victimization. No, uh, the opposite. You're you keep bringing up a point that there's racism, and I'm like, how are you no. saying it? You're the one who believes on the devil. So no. I'm not let bringing it up. I'm just responding to it. Okay, that's yeah, I'll let you example. explain. You're right. I'm that's sorry. Example. I'll let you explain. Because you insist on nothing you have gotten from me, nothing you have gotten from Sister Janita. You've been on our platform just four hours now. You guys are very diplomatic and nice. No, no. I'm of good character. And see, you, you trivializing that point, right? You aren't treated diplomatically. You are treated with the respect that you deserve. Oh, that's no, that's so silly. It seems like you are searching for. No. Let's say I write, a, I write a book, and in my book, I write all about that the black person is a way lower form of human than the white person. The black person doesn't stand in the, in the evolutional scale of the white person. Let's write a whole book about this. And now I'm talking to you, and I'm be, I'm going to treat you ni- like a nice guy, but you're still going to look at me and be like, yeah, but you still think I'm lower than you on the chain. Right. So like, it's fine you, how you treat me. But you keep quoting you, and you never quote me. You have well, a you habit. said white man of the devil. Right, right. You have a habit of quoting you and putting your words in my mouth. Well, let me know what and I even, said that was even, wrong. And even when I clarify what I said and I remind you of what I said. You said, I'm not the devil, but the white man is the devil. That's what you said. I, I, absolutely. Okay. That, that's, and, I'm just, then, just making sure that's what we're saying. And you asked me a legitimate question. What is the devil? And that's okay. the right question. And we are analyzing that question. Now, you're insistent. One of trivializing the respect that I'm showing to you. No, God forbid. God right. forbid. No, because way. I need you to understand. I just yeah. I'm telling you, you don't have to show me respect. I'm chill. I'm like, good. You don't, no, I don't need the respect. I'm not going like, just respect. let me know what it is. Take off the gloves and yeah, tell me if I'm the devil or not. You don't understand the students of the Honorable Miss Lewis Fark. I'm not being diplomatic. It's more insulting to treat me, you know, like, just tell me. No. I'm telling you, Rabbi Harry. It, you, it, you, you, you clearly aren't familiar with the level of character that the Honorable Mince Lewis Farrakhan I respected it. it I, followers. It's fine and by that, me. I, I you're, like having, you're, you're having difficulty. No, no. I think it's great that you're nice and you treat people with respect. That's great. No, right. It is, except you seem to think that it's because I'm being diplomatic, because I don't want to hurt your feelings. I'm not cut like that. I'm cut. Oh, I'm in the process of being cut and chiseled into certain type of human beings. That God wants black people to evolve too. I understand you may have had some engagements with black people who is not under, have not put themselves under God's in the hand of God's man, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. But be real clear, Rabbi Harry, we respect you, we don't fear you. 
We, we, we aren't overly concerned with you getting in your feelings. We are a respectful people. What you are getting from me is what you would get from any follower of the Honorable Brother Minister Farrakhan, whom you would be engaging. It's because this is a type of humanity that we represent. This is an illustration of very tiny, but an illustration nonetheless of the human transformation that God is affecting among black people through his man, the Honorable Brother Minister Farrakhan. So your insistence on being victimized on this platform, it falls flat. You will never be treated as anything other than a guest. I, I don't feel victimized on your platform, just to let you know. You and I want, I also, crying I also want, a lot of how Jews, you know, when we talk, like, we go in hard, but it's not personal. So if I get, like, you know, if I'm making but a you point... But insist on personalizing it. No. What I, what I do think is the most ridiculous thing that we're dancing around the elephant in the room is that if I wrote down or if I believed what you believe, you would use it against me as a point of racism. Absolutely not. You got us confused with Negro. No, because you no, you're you're wrong because you're already using small examples from the Talmud to show that from this stems and uh you know anti-black mentality and the suffering of black comes from these things. Again, again, and I explained to you, Rabbi Harry, the context in which I invoke those passages. It wasn't that text. I was making the point. You're making. I was not making a point you're making. I was making my point with those illustrations. And you want to, it appears, impose your thinking on us. Let me be real clear. Well, we, 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 we are not, we in the nation of Islam, we are not offended by talk of superiority, inferiority, double God, whichever direction it goes, we are not sensitive like that. We have a different approach to such discourse. Racism in Egypt isn't in words. Racism in evil is in deed. I did not cite the Talmud as an example of evil, I cited them in the context of the discussion of theological racial justice. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Is it is it not theologically racist for you to say that you are superior to me because you are the original strain and I'm the grafted one? I'm sorry. Is it not theological racism for you to say that you are the superior being and I am the lower form because I was grafted? Again, you never heard those. I'm asking. I'm asking you a question. I didn't say you said that. I'm asking you a question. No. No. Superiority and inferiority is not determined by color of skin, especially. Well, especially. Let, let me. So let me answer. Okay. Don't, we can speak for ourselves. Oh, so by all means. Especially in the context of America, in American race relations, any su superiority that I will have over any human being will be based on my fidelity to the will of God and righteousness. Failure to live up to the standard that God wants for me and black people in America. It so facto makes me inferior to any other human being that would be faithful to the will of God. So superiority and inferiority is not a race thing today, absolutely not. That's not my and that's not this. Okay. I have a question. Um, 
the collective history of white individuals going to pretty much every country that they went to, they've colonized, dominated, raped, murdered, under manifest destiny. Uh, to call that out and to say that those actions in of themselves are devilish, is that, I, I'm not quite, sh I would like to be educated on how is that racist, right? And then how- Well, no, it... that, that's not racist. Okay. Because we were the product of some of those crazy European people who didn't shower once a year and got drunk and came to our villages and raped us also. So we were like, oh man, these crazy Europeans are so backwards and uncivilized and you know we're scared when they get drunk because when they get drunk you, you know who they're coming for so like we lived in fear of these europeans we just didn't see it as like oh it's because because they're white is why they act this way Th that that like wasn't the connection we made but for sure you can speculate on on the history of white european men on the evils that they've uh, done across the world without being called racist but if i came to you guys and i said you know what i think black people are the devil some jaws would drop. Not in here. Well, in real life, in the real world, if I go out there in the streets and say black people are the devil, they're going to say, you, my friend, are a racist. I don't know, because, you know, just well, going I through know. higher education, you go to those classes. I've had classes where they pathologize black individuals, say we're hyper violent, hypersexual, right? And like you'll just be sometimes the only like one of the only black people in there. And it's it's actually really normal to be in a school system and just to hear that as a black person. I think it's different to say what speculate and what's happening in a culture based on, you know, observing a culture, which uh, it's not my expertise, but to say, hey, we're observing this culture and this is the, the takeaways we're getting from it is not racist or, or but it's different to say, hey, blanket statement, black people are devils. Is much different yeah. than to say we mm -hmm. see in this society this is how they're acting. Is much different mm -hmm. than me saying black people are all devils. Mm -hmm. And if I said that, I couldn't even imagine. Right. And so, this was a great conversation. We're four hours in. I'm tremendously humbled and honored that you would engage us, give us so much of your time, Rabbi Harry. Um, I think we have a tremendous amount to chew on and to parse and to learn from. Are there any closing remarks you want to make and offer us um, before sure. we sign out? My, my final points, I would say, are I believe that the ancient prophecies of the God of Israel are being manifest before our eyes in terms of the house of Israel awakening from different races, religions, and peoples uniting. I don't see any other platform or religion in the world uniting colors and religions as is this Israelite in gathering is. I think that people returning to the land of Israel and rebuilding it is prophetic. And then finding tribes around the world waking up is prophetic. My, my, my goal for this and my goal moving forward is to be a facilitator in any way I can in the re reawakening of the Israelite spirit of the African American and forgetting religion, forgetting Talmud, forgetting all those things, figuring out how we could decentralize, get resources, stop funding entities that are financing wars, putting poisons in our body. If, if you had that conversation with me and that was like what we spoke about, it would have a bigger effect than if we spoke about what we did speak about, even though I think a theological conversation is beautiful, I think we're in code red. So it's like when the canoe's going off the, the waterfall, it's not the right time for the conversation because we gotta figure out how to stop the canoe from crashing. So I think that we are in a very small window of time right now where we have human freedoms that may one day be taken away from us. And um, whether it's white people or Jewish people or Zionist people involved in that, like I said, I'm willing to to get to get my hands dirty and fight the battle for the good fight. So the next time I hope I can talk to you, I'd love to talk about how we're actually going to mobilize for the decentralization where we're going to make our own electricity like Nikola Tesla was trying to do. We're going to make our own food systems and we're going to and we're going to figure this out. And then I promise you, you and me, we can sit down with the scriptures open and we can break bread and prove each other's points and look at the Hebrew words and the Latin words and do all that. Uh, but until then, I think that a stumbling block to get there, and this may, I don't want to be the low blower, a stumbling block to get there may be the preconceived notion that I'm a devil, may be a very tricky thing because I'm not coming to the table with preconceived notions. Um, even though I could be, 
you're 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 a genius with your words. You were trained with absolute genius of how to speak like a like like a real proper awesome good human, and I love it and I respect it. But at the end of the day, I it that all the way you talk, it doesn't have so much of a value to me. If deep, deep, deep downside, I know somewhere that you really believe I'm the devil, and I know I keep saying it, but it it it, it takes away from how nice you are as a human. Even though I I think like you you would you'd be the guy. If I needed ten bucks, you'd probably loan me. You're a nice guy. You're a great guy. But at the end of the day, you believe I'm a devil. So how could we get to the equal equal table position here? And in your narrative, I don't think I'm included in that. And that's fine. For me, I'm not offended. And uh, and I respect you guys. I respect Minister Farrakhan for the good he does for his people. They should the, Your people should have protectors and the people who look out after them. And they shouldn't be persecuted without, you know, people getting their back and exposing injustice. So for that, I give him all due respect. And... As far as uh, the messianic stuff goes, we'll see. You know who who's the messiah when when world peace comes. That's all speculation in my eyes, and I guess those are my final statements. And I do. I just want to apologize. I cut you off a lot of times. I must. No. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm nothing to apologize. Okay. For. I just want to throw it out there. Exchange. Yeah. It was okay. an exchange. Nothing personal. And you and and your host also was was extremely lovely and pleasant in the way she spoke. And um, and on that note, if there's anything I could help do to make comments about Zionist people when you don't want someone to get called anti-Semite, I'll say it for you guys. I'll be your mouthpiece, like your white mouthpiece that you could use to to go in and fight that battle. So you guys could uh, tap me in when the time's right. And otherwise, that's it. I'm just trying to stay humble and, and be a good servant of the Most High. Well, thank you. And friendly reminder, people, um, the rabbis, oh, well, we just put it back there. Yep. His website is itribe.us. US. You also offer an online course, right? That's accredited. Right. I have an online course on the Lost Tribes of Israel um, at uh, losttribes.education. So if people want to just get firsthand account of who's who, where they are in the world, what prophecies they're pot potentially filling, it's a free course. If you want college credit, you can get college credit for it. It's the iTribe it's undergrad, website. right? Yes, undergrad degree. Mm -hmm. iTribe website I mentioned to you is our efforts for this decentralization is uh, a mapping platform where communities are registering. And then what we do is channel international philanthropy. Instead of going to projects that aren't meaningful or impactful, it will go to communities to build them greenhouses, electricity systems and stuff. So let's say I have a community in Chicago that comes up to me and says, we got an abandoned lot that, you know, and by the way, they did this in Cleveland. I'm just going to give a shout out to the, I think it's called the Green Ghetto. It's a farm in Cleveland that was once, a, you know, an abandoned property where there was drugs and in an African American community, and it was it was a very bad neighborhood. And they turned this empty property into a greenhouse, and they're making fish and plants, and they transformed the whole entire community. So what I want to do is create a highway between serious money or philanthropy, especially in the Jewish world, to your everyday community in America who's going to get. Uh, I think we lost him. We're honored to have had um, so much time for a thoughtful, candid exchange with Rabbi Harry. And I can only echo his closing remarks in terms of striving to do the will of the Most High. That is that is where we are at, and those are the perfect words to to end on because that's not race specific. Mm -hmm. If there's any question for the audience, that determines superiority and inferiority today. The superior ones are the ones who are faithful to the will of the Most High. Thank you. Well, Powerful Creators, it has been a crazy show. It has been very informative. If you want to help support the Do The Math platform, please go to our Patreon and join today. Without your support, we're not able to keep up these uh, historic conversations because uh, first off, this has never happened before and it just happened. And I was really excited. I learned a lot. 
one of the th things that I really learned from this conversation is that there is a time to listen and there is a time to speak and ask questions. And it really takes discernment. So I know I have my listening ears on and my learning hat on today, and uh, I'm probably going to have to watch this show again to learn some more. While there probably were some stuff that didn't get answered, like I, I still don't clearly understand what is anti-Semitism. Uh, so hopefully someone can uh, let me know. Uh, but I also realize I'm not the only one that's alone on that one. Uh, that would be awesome. But if not, that's totally fine. Nonetheless, though, thank you all for tuning in today. I'm really appreciative uh, that Dr. Wesley and, and Rabbi Harry gave us so much of their time and energy today. And it was just amazing to learn from the both of you. And I, you know, I thank you for letting me be a fly on the wall. <laughs> You you did an awesome job. It was a a robust and a not an easy conversation to manage, and the exchange uh, I think needed to happen. I think a lot was put on the table to chew on, to reflect on. I think I think a number of important things were illustrated. Um, thank you for your management. Um, and the energy you brought to the discussion and praise belongs to Allah. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you all, everybody. We will be back with another great episode until next time. Please share, 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 like, 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 and support us on Patreon. All right, powerful creators. See you later.